Okay, um, we'll play our house announcement, um, a safety announcement, and then Stacy will speak. Welcome to the University Inn and Conference Center. We place a high priority on preserving your health and safety. Please give me your attention for a few moments as I outline the emergency procedures to be followed at today's event. This building is equipped with a fire alarm system. In the event of an emergency, the alarm will sound. Since there are no planned fire drills for today, if the alarm sounds, it will be treated as a real emergency. Once the alarm has sounded, calmly make your way through one of the exits. These two exits, which are clearly marked, are to the left and the right of the media stage area. Please take a moment to identify the exits nearest to you. Once outside the room, make your way to the muster point, which is located east of the building that abounds the St. Augustine Circular Road. Stay at the muster point and await further instructions. In the event of an earthquake, stay calm, look out for falling debris. Once this shaking stops, exit the building in a calm and orderly manner and assemble at the muster point where you'll receive further instructions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, everyone, good morning. I just wanted to give a warm welcome to each and every one of you to thank you for coming here for this final session of the module. Thank you for the dedication and commitment that you've shown over the last couple of months. I'm actually very proud of all of you, and you all look so nice today. So I want you to relax, because this presentation is also to see how you have implemented or will implement the lessons that you've learned over the last couple of months. And we are here to provide feedback and give you guidance, because it's not for you to feel like hey, I'm under so much pressure. All right, it's all to help you MEs, to help you at the ME when you go back, and, and so we will do what we can to assist. So relax, I'm sure all of you know what it is you're going to be doing, you are comfortable with your material, and we look forward to you implementing everything that you've learned over the last couple. So, because we have a tight schedule today, uh, we'll get started with Guyana, who will make the first presentation. So let's give her a warm welcome. Today, the Guyana Football Federation will be making a presentation on our academy training center. So, firstly, as we all know, Guyana's football is on the rise. We have recently um, qualified for the CONCACAF Gold Cup in 2019. We participate in the CONCACAF Nations League, and we um, are currently participating in um, Group B. Group C, it actually is supposed to be Group C of League B of the Nations League. We have our second match on Monday in Guyana, our second home match. And um, of course, we continue to strive for the Qatar 2020 World Cup. That's our aim. Um, it is the most, it is the second most popular sport in Guyana, and we're um, working on retooling and building capacity and reinvigorating football through redevelopment programs like our academy training center. And we're in the process of building our new national training center, which will be our home of football. And we're working towards bringing Guyana's football to the world via live streaming. We're still working on that. And of course, we're always open to business. And saying that, our strategic goal, one of our strategic goals is to enable the, enable the establishment of academy training centers in each army. And this will facilitate the growth and development of elite coaches and elite players. 
Our academy training center is the first nationwide youth system. And as you can see me there, I came through the academy as well. Um, it'll be nine academy training centers within our nine RMAs. We'll have three weekly youth sessions from the ages 13 to 17, boys and girls. It'll be age-specific coaching curriculum, and we'll have um, national coaching and playing philosophy, of course, and it'll help to develop, develop the life skills training, and it'll be our pathway to the national team. These are our locations on the map. As you can see them there, we have nine locations. Partica, Burbies, East Bank, East Demerara, Essequibo, Georgetown, Rupununi, Upper Demerara, and West Demerara. On the map, as you can see, we have the nine locations. They're spread out, fairly spread out. Um, this is our training schedule, per se. We have the on the 13, on the 15, on the 17, boys and girls, they'll have two hour weekly sessions, which will give them 18 hours across the nine MAs weekly and 72 hours monthly. So that's the amount of training that our youths would receive. Um, the objective of this, of course, is to support the play of performance clock, which is the target of 10 to 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, which will help to develop the Guyanese elite performance. It will, of course, increase the player population across Guyana, and it will improve the youth, the quality of youth coaching and upskill the coaching staff. Um, we use this as a base for our talent ID, and like I said before, to produce players for the national teams. Some of our good governance principles is inclusion. Um, of course, we're including all MAs. We're not ex excluding anybody. It will help in capacity building, integrity, transparency, of course, accountability, and monitoring and evaluation. Um, this is uh, our GFF technical staff structure. We have the technical director. He's in charge of the technical department. Then directly under him is the secretary. And then comes our development officers. We have women's development officer, school development officer, youth development officer, coach education and development officer, and of course our national team programs. And what we're focusing on today is, comes under the youth development officer. We have the TDOs, as we call them, the technical development officers. They're in charge of the academies and under them is a youth development coach. Some of the reporting that we use for our academy, um, financial reporting firstly, we um, process the TDOs and YDOs, YDCs, which is the youth development coaches, we process their stipend through the payroll. And um, to receive, the RMAs receive funding from us to help them in, um, in the program, let's say that. So like um, help them, support them in the program with their equipment and stuff. We provide that funding to the MAs and the MAs assist the academy. And of course the MAs need to report to us monthly on how they utilize the funds towards the academies. Um, for the non-financial, uh, we have a reporting template that we give to the TDOs and they have to fill this on a weekly basis. and feed it back to the, our youth development officer, who will feed that to the technical director. And of course, we'll have monthly meetings with the TDOs, YDOs, and the technical department to help with the academies. Some of our human resources in the academy or the technical department, let's say, we have the TDOs, we have the YDOs, we have the YDCs, we have the technical secretary, we have the technical director, and of course, we have the staff of the Football Federation. Um, some of the material resources of the academies would be the balls, the cones, the bibs that we have. We have um, the water bottles, the uniforms. We have our national training center, which will be the main one, and among other things. 
financial resource, of course, we receive funds from One CONCACAF and FIFA. That's mainly the funds that we use towards the academies. This is just an overview of our budget. As you can see, it's a fairly hefty budget, but um, we try to work with it. We try to make it work. Um, of course, we try to solicit sponsorship to help with this. So, uh, SWOT analysis. Some of the strengths that we have is that we have specialized training. So we have specialized training for all age groups. We have, um, of course, the coaches. They're all certified. They're all the licensed coaches. Um, so they deliver structured sessions. Um, of course, it's an established structure for the development, for the player development pathway into the national teams. And it's unison of the playing philosophy, national playing philosophy across all the MAs. Um, our weakness, of course, is the buy-in from the MAs. They don't see it absolutely necessary to have an academy because they think, of course, that they're doing enough. Um, also, is the scouting process. Um, our MAs don't have as much tournament, so there isn't much opportunity for scouting. That's a weakness. And, of course, the monitoring and evaluation part, um, we, there's a lack of funding when it comes to that because our YDO would actually have to travel to these MAs to do evaluation. So funding, of course, impedes that process. Opportunities that we have, it's a massive potential impact on creating an outstanding elite player pool for future national teams. And of course, it creates a solid structure for association football at all junior levels. And it creates an optimal product for development of football countrywide. Um, our threats is a lack of funding, of course. Um, but we try to deal with this by soliciting sponsorship, as I said before. And of course, another threat is a lack of support from the member associations. Um, they don't think, like I said, they don't think it's necessary. Um, best analysis, um, politically, it's an opportunity to support development across Ghana. And we have the equality of programs across all MAs, so no one is excluded, everyone is included. And um, of course, we have venues available to us in all our regional member associations. Economically, distribution of material and financial resources in the MAs to aid in their development. Um, socially, it creates an avenue for players to come and showcase their skills and, of course, interact. Um, it keeps them away from negative activities. Uh, technically, we use computers to document the process and we also use recording devices to document, um, to record the session so they can do assessment on them. Um, partnership assets, we have, of course, when we're engaging partners, we have um, some assets that are valuable to them, like venue signage, match tickets, we experiences, we have media assets, they're able to do broadcasting. Of course, they can use our um, images or anything that's produced in the academy. They can have use to it. They can have access to team players if they want brand ambassadors, etc. cetera. Um, of course, they can do promotion. They can do in-venue activation spaces. They can do programming if they want to, um, like they can provide uh, sponsorship to a kid or, um, I'm losing the word. <laughs> so um, they also have right of entitlement. They can do category exclusivity if they want to be seen as the official um, water sponsor or whatever for the academy. They can use our designation or phrases. They can also use our brand. And of course, they can um, sponsor training kits, etc. Um, these are all, all of our platforms, but of course we're focusing on the academy and the academy training centers. And the way we communicate it, we have a weekly um, 
weekly newspaper feature that goes out in the national newspaper. Uh, we have weekly television shows, we have radio programs, media releases, and we also advertise on our digital media platforms. So um, we're actually doing an event. It's an on the 13 event, which will feature the on the 30 team from all the MAs. They'll have two groups. It'll be a knockout format, 8v8 with a 20 minutes playing time. The goal, of course, is to identify the outstanding talent for the under 13s. Um, the objective is to provide structured competitions to stimulate involvement of the under 13 boys and of course a platform towards national teams. We're targeting the players and families and of course all the players between the academy age. It's of course, like I said, an inter-academy football tournament to identify talent. It'll be in January, and it'll be at our National Training Center. This will be our venue zone plan. It's a bit small, but that's what our National Training Center will look like. And evaluation. So doing evaluation for the um, academy will be holding meetings after every session to deal with um, of course, pros and cons. Um, we'll do reporting, and we'll, of course, elicit written feedback from everyone involved, and we'll do on-site surveys. So management of the facility, of course, it's our national training center, like I said. Um, it'll be located in close proximity of our National Stadium, which is very accessible to everyone. It will be managed by the Technical Department of the Federation. We'll have a lot of modern amenities, like we'll have internet access, we'll have air-conditioned rooms, we'll have enough advertising space for everyone, concession booths, etc. And of course, the capacity will be 5,000. Um, maintenance and security. It will be secured by a top security form, and um, of course we'll have physical security as well on a 24-hour basis. And in the event there's an activity, we'll have additional security personnel, and we have a full-time maintenance officer to help in maintaining the center. Questions? Okay. Hello? Thank you very much. Um, so she went a little over 12, so we will leave it at 15. <laughs> I think it'll be between 12 and 15, so that's fine. So anybody have any questions out in the audience? She was very clear and articulate, and you know everything. Very nice, hold on. Hi. Um, how exactly will the project improve good governance? I saw that was one of your points on your governance slide. And you had a lot of different areas. So how do you see the project improving good governance? Um, well, it, is, it improves because um, at first we didn't have these. We had an academy training center, but it wasn't in all the RMAs. So of course, um, we're including everybody now. So I said inclusion of everybody. Um, it's also um, in the monitoring and evaluation part, it was, the academy was functioning, but nobody was monitoring it. So I think that helps now that we're doing a monitoring and evaluation every month on all the academies around. Is there any, uh, so get me, just clarify, is, are there new centers or are there existing centers? There are existing centers that we're um, continuing to help them in uh, running the academy in the way it's supposed to be run. Okay, thanks. But you, right, sorry. You also mentioned that the MEs didn't buy in. How are you going to get the MEs to buy into this project? Well, of course, they didn't buy in because um, they think it was a financial burden. So now we're providing sponsorship and so to them, so it'll help them. And 
just one more thing with the communications. I saw all of the external communication that you were going to do. How were you communicating it internally? Into, sorry? Internally. Internally, like yeah, in the federation? Yes. Um, well, we have, uh, of course, we have our meetings that will be held. So we'll communicate everything on a weekly basis. We have weekly meetings, the technical department hosts. So they include all their, the technical aspects. There is time for a last question. First of all, thank you, because the presentation was very good and pretty comprehensive. Um, the question I have, you um, highlighted very well uh, all the opportunities of, um, of the project. Um, if, I, if I ask you what is the main risk, because you also highlight a little bit the risk, but you focus more on opportunities. What is the main risk in, of this project in your opinion? Uh, the main risk? The main risk, yeah. Um, I think it's the, the program not achieving its objectives, I think, because we have to, like I said, we really have to work with the MAs to get them to buy into the program. So I think the main risk is them not receiving it. Final question. How do you um, take this risk? What are the strategy uh, you have in mind in order to tackle this risk, if this risk proves to be real. Sorry, I didn't get the question, sorry. Well, let's imagine that this risk that you just mentioned it, 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 yeah, um, is, is real and it proves uh, real. How do you tackle this risk? What is your strategy in order to face this, this risk? Strategy in order to, yeah, face, to, the to risk? face the risk? Yeah. Um, I guess it's just uh, reintroducing it to them every time and letting them know the consequences and the importance of the project to our development. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we will now have Grenada. Good morning, everyone. The topic we chose, facility development under our new strategic planning, 2019 to 2022. We went specific in the upgrading of a field in each parish in Grenada and Karakou and Piti Martinique. Today's presentation will be done by myself, Andre Charles, and Mr. Bruce Swan. First, to get the ball rolling, we will play a short video
So based on our strategic plan, we have selected the fifth pillar, development of the football facility across Grenada, Caracou, and Piti Martinique. There are three areas, short term, medium term, and long term. We chose one of the projects under medium term to develop a facility, to develop seven facilities throughout Grenada, Caracou, and Piti Martinique, each being in each parishes and one in Karaku and Piti Martinique. This project will be responsible, the person responsible for this project will be the general secretary. The overseeing of the project will be the executive, um, the measure or the period for the, um, the project will be 2020. The objective of the project, the goal is, the goal of the project is to help improve the performance of youth players in the villages. The project targets venues and groundsmen in the village outside the town area. The area should have primary school near the playing field and at least three, within three communities within a radius of five miles. The specific objective are as follows. Improve the playing surface of selective venue. Improve the lighting facility in area that have lights. Train facility managers in football pitch maintenance and purchase age appropriate goals for youth football. These objectives will result in players and coaches improving their performance on a well-maintained ground, thus contributing to the improved quality of football among youths. At this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Swan. Thank you, Andre. I'm smiling because Andre was nervous since last night. <laughs> um, this is just a logical framework. Uh, we're not getting a good view here. But this is um, the logical framework of how the project will be implemented. Um, the inputs, we would obviously have to get a MOU with government. Uh, we have to get a license to use the facility. Um, we also would upgrade the lighting facilities, um, purchase the equipment, um, conduct a, a workshop with the groundsmen that are in charge of the facilities. And um, again, putting new topsoil on the facilities and we are assuming that the government would um, support this program. And the outputs we expect, I really don't like what I'm seeing here, but the output we expect is an improved playing surface that we would have trained groundsmen in maintenance of the facility. and. Um, we would have facilities ready to be used by youths at any time. And we are assuming that um, the Football Association, as part of its responsibility, would organize um, competitions along with the communities. And we would achieve our purpose by establishing youth football over a nine month period. And once that continues, um, we would have uh, increased quality of football among our youths. As we know, um, we are really focused on improving the facilities. We know that um, during the region, we were chastised for not having a um, nice playing surface. And for the last eight years, we know CONCACAF was on a drive to ensure that our playing surfaces um, are, are smooth. And um, we have seen the result of this, where our national team players, they are playing much better the balls are playing on the ground and we want to transition that into our youths. Also, um, we have a number of about 97 facilities in Grenada and it is broken down. Um, the international grounds, major grounds, uh, secondary, minor, and sub-minor. Um, the international grounds, of course, we have a cricket stadium and the football stadium, but our focus for the project will be the minor grounds and the minor grounds would be outside of the um, 
outside of the towns within the parishes. And um, there is only one parish there, St. Mark's, um, and that would be, let me put this on here. This parish here, St. Mark's, they do not have a minor ground. So we're going to use, uh, they have four sub-minor grounds, so we're going to use one um, to develop so that we can focus our youth players in that area. There is obviously a demand for this. Uh, FIFA 2.0 um, tells us that we must play youth football in two categories, um, in boys and girls, uh, over a six-month period, and therefore we want to designate these facilities to ensure we achieve um, this goal um, in 2020-2021, right? Since, since the project would be finished in 2020. Also, um, in 2015, when um, we only trained one groundsman on facility maintenance, and um, that was when we were preparing to host the CONCACAF under 17 girls. Uh, therefore, it is important that we train the others um, for the facilities that we are going to develop. How we plan to implement this? We're going to do this in three, uh, four phases. Um, in phase one, we're going to make sure that we have all the relevant documentation and approval required for the project. Um, that is getting the license, um, getting all the bidding documents, and making sure everything is approved by executive, uh, and um, ensuring that government do the approval, sending up the project for approval uh, for FIFA. In the next phase, uh, we're going to work with the contractors now, just uh, finalizing the scope of work and signing the contracts. That would be contractors that would be upgrading the lights, upgrading the field, um, executing the workshop with the groundsmen. In the third phase, um, that is the actual implementation phase where they're going to be actually going out and, and do the lights and do the playing surface. Uh, we're going to be procuring the goals and we're going to actually be holding the workshop with the groundsmen. In phase four is the closing of the project. And there we would ensure that our engineers uh, validate the work done according to the baselines established. And um, once that is approved, the Grenada Football Association and the government of Grenada will host the official opening ceremonies at each venue. And following this, we would submit our closing report to FIFA. Our communication, um, external communication, um, that is with the contractors and with government. So in phase one and the public, we would have a press conference, both jointly with government and Grenada Football Association. And the, the, there we would state the objectives of the project. Um, then once that is finished um, and the go to phase two, we would have a press release notifying them, the public again, of the start of the project and the venues again and the disruption expected in the areas and the alternative venues that they have available to them. Um, in phase three of the project, which is the actual implementation, we would get um, we will do weekly updates to our stakeholders through press releases and um, our social media pages and uh, emails. At the completion of um, phase three, um, the GS would hold a press conference notifying the public that we have um, finished the project and um, the next steps is the implementation. We will notify them of the programs that would come to the venue. For the official ceremonies, um, we would do an advertisement on the radio and television, inviting the general public to the official opening ceremonies of these venues. Internally, um, the project officer uh, would give weekly updates at our staff meeting. The GS will give um, weekly updates to the president and monthly updates to the executive. Um, daily communication between the project officer and contractors uh, will take place and um, other communication will be as needed. 
However, any decisions that um, are taken during that period shall be communicated in writing. This is our management um, operations. Of course, the executive committee on top. We have the general secretary, the project manager. The executive um, basically would be responsible for selecting the venues, approving the contractors. The general secretary would deal with the milestones and processing the payment, uh, sending the payment through, approving those payments. Um, the project officer will deal with the approvals on day-to-day -day businesses. There will be an environmental impact, and um, that is basically where we will be removing the soil. We will definitely disturb um, living organisms within that area. There are risks associated with doing that project. Since we're working on grounds, the weather in the Caribbean um, would affect the, the project between June and December. So we're focusing on um, January to May to execute that project. Also, the availability of um, the proper materials um, if we topsoil um, may not be consistent with the quality, so we need to do an assessment of that before it is used. And the necessary equipment on the ground um, may not be available, therefore we would need to put that in our bidding process that they, we ensure that they have those um, equipment. Finance analysis. The GFA slash FIFA intend to spend approximately $140,000 on this project. There are seven facilities. 20000 would be spent on each facility through Grenada, Caracu, and Piti Matnik. 80% of the funds would be dis disbursed at the beginning of the project and 20% at the end of the project. This project would also be partly funded by the government. Economical analysis. Meeting the economy need, Grenada Football Association is constrained by the limited financial resource on the take development project that are required within the trial island state of Grenada, Karku, and Pitimati. This project will reduce the financial burden on the Grenada Football Association, thus allowing the Football Association to meet the need of the prospective footballers within the various communities. Job opportunities are created directly, and people providing auxiliary service also. The development session will enable the coaches to gain advantage in the job market for coaching and physical education teacher, thus enabling thus enabling them to gain employment opportunity where needed. The beneficiaries. At the end of the project, the following stakeholder will benefit. With a better playing surface, youth in the surrounding community will be able to improve the football skills. Rungsmen will have better knowledge and understanding of facility management. The coaches and physical education teachers will have safer surface to train GFA, the Grenada Football Association, will be able to establish youth competition over a nine months period. Thank you. The end. Any questions? Hopefully not. That's, like I said, it's from FIFA. We will also have assistance from the government. Contribution. Yeah, correct. But linked to that question, was there a budget? Did you have a budget for what you anticipate this thing will cost? No, we didn't have an actual budget. What we did, we uh, went around and get some the average cost because this project is not yet into full go so we don't have a final so we just have an average which is a twenty thousand dollar from 
GFA. Right. 20,000 from the GFA, but you have an average of the overall. The, the overall, overall cost, cost would be there about, I think, 50,000 per field. And what if the government does not support? Because you all said that the government may not. What happens? What, what are you going to do if the government does not support the project? Well, then we have to go to plan B, probably ask FIFA for some more funding so that we can um, <laughs> maintain the. Um, Well, um, it is what we know is part of the government mandate to upgrade uh, facilities every year. So what we're doing is, is partnering with them, basically. So it is budgeted for in their national budget. Yeah, and I know that because I have a close relationship. <laughs> sure. I think just to clarify, the government and with reference to the field, what kind of relationship would you have to develop with them? Well, um, we have established relationships already. Um, most of our, we have four, which we have a license to use, all right? And we do the development work there. We're actually, um, in the next four weeks, we'll be installing some bleachers there. So we have that relationship where our, um, administrative offices we have a relationship where we share facilities with the ministry of forestry and uh, we're working with them to also um, change the the facilities that was allocated for our technical center so we have a very good relationship with government and we're going to establish a license um, to use the facilities i, I ask that question because um most of the facilities in, in the Caribbean are owned by the government, so it's really developed like, like a lease agreement where you have it over a period and it's just an understanding. It could just put you out any time. <laughs> well, we have uh, two arrangements. We have a lease arrangement with some of our facilities, and that is where our administrative office and the technical center, um, with four, with, we have a license, so we have preferential um, arrangement to use the facilities over a, a number of years while we do our development work there for football. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And we do apologize for the slides. Yes. And we welcome we good friend Barbados. I've taken the chance to introduce him. <laughs> yes, that's very lovely. <laughs> Good morning. Our project is establishing a semi-professional league, the Barbados Premier League, and this is by myself, Edwin Wood, and Soraya Topping Herbert. Soraya couldn't be here today. She's in Jamaica playing football. Lucky her. <laughs> yeah, we got trunks last night. <laughs> uh, the Barbados Football Association in its 2017-2019 strategic plan under the pillar of leagues and clubs set a goal to improve the standard of leagues and clubs in Barbados. Our number one objective is to establish a semi-professional league. Within this strategic plan, our mission had changed to better football for a better life, a successful semi-professional league would serve as justice to this newly formed mission. In order to prepare our members and administrators, the events leading up to it must form part of our strategy for the next couple of years. Our first action was to evaluate the current league and club structure. This was this would give us a realistic picture of where we are and determine the areas for improvement. Our second action was to create a club licensing criteria and to determine how this all fits in that 
club licensing framework. Other than altering administrative processes, we also recognize that we had to create a very competitive brand of football if we were to succeed. This meant revising the current structure of our league and how clubs and other stakeholder, stakeholders viewed us as an association. Equally important is how this structure is implemented to ensure that anything we change and the speed at which the changes were made did not, did not negatively impact on how well the clubs could function. Hence, a gradual approach was adopted. This document will outline the BFA's approach or readiness for a semi-professional league using the topics of the eight modules of the FIFA CIES Football Executive Program. How ready are we for a professional football league? A little bit of history. We had organized football starting in 1910 with the formal constitution of the Barbados Football Association. It has always been an amateur sport and it has been organized for males only. Football has grown into the most popular local sport in terms of the level of participation and rivalry, rivalry among clubs and schools was intense and the quality of play was at a high standard attracting a high level of spectatorship. A number of outstanding players emerged in the 1950s and the early 60s. During that colonial period, Barbados participated only in inter-territorial territorial competitions involving Trinidad, Jamaica, and Guyana. But after independence in 1966, and especially in the 70s, that football started to experience major changes as a number of important developments took place. Barbados became a member of FIFA in 1966, took part in its first, first FIFA World Cup preliminaries in 1968, and the level of participation in football increased significantly from 1975. BFA has since seen a dramatic increase in club participation. The BFA now has 76 licensed clubs in 2019, with approximately 9,000 players participating. This includes about 4,000 youth playing in the BFA's U9, 11, 13, 15, and 17 competitions and the school's leagues, about 300 women of all ages, and about 45 others playing across four senior men's divisions. The organization of football. Over the last four years, the Barbados Football Association has made some adjustments to its governance structure to better align itself with what is required of FIFA and to ensure that it can better serve its management membership. The most major change has been the revision of the statutes, the revision of the executive board. We had to limit this to 12 members. It used to be like 20, 20 something and the number and types of standing and judiciary committees were changed. While not perfect, there are clear guidelines on what committees are required and all judiciary bodies are now independent of the BFA membership. The electoral process for members to form the, exec the executive board was also changed to a more democratic and transparent one clear guidelines on how members should vote and who, sh who was eligible to vote. A disciplinary code was established for the first time, a code of ethics and a referee's code of conduct. The BFA further ensured that all its members were kept informed through the creation of a website, which provided all rules and existing documents to its members at any given time. All audited financial statements are posted on the website, and on the website as well members could be assured that there was transparency. Restructuring within the secretariat was also necessary. Persons were hired with specific skill sets and applied to key roles. Some key positions established, established were the head of finance, a finance and planning officer, and a players and competitions logistics manager. administration and finance. For any semi-professional league to succeed, it has to be properly administered and have a solid financial 
management plan. The BFA struggled in the area of finance largely because of lack of financial resources available to it to effectively run its existing leagues. Withdrawal of major sponsors from its top league as a result of low spectatorship at its games and the stigma of violence attached to football in Barbados. It consists of a particular category of persons who are or may be engaged in violent activity as well. With reference to administration, the semi-professional league will require an uninterrupted push. Some key positions that would be needed for the semi-professional league, we need a general manager, a finance manager, a competitions director, a marketing director, and communications director. Strategy and project management. A strategic plan represents a pathway for how the league will sustain itself and grow in the coming years. It should, it should, enable, it should enable the BFA to provide the tools and avenues for our future stars and football administrators. Plan should have core values which not only will allow us to enjoy the game, but will determine how we administer the game. It should allow us to identify our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities for growth, and potential threats. We also have to undertake a pest analysis to identify the key elements of the league's political, economic, social, and technical environments to determine our current situation in relation to our goals. Governmental issues for infrastructure and financial support, i.e. the removal of taxes or for the provision of existing resources, uh, the economic benefits, the players stand to gain substantial income and will be exposed to more opportunities, societal benefits, league providing empl employment for other persons, other than administrators, but the vendors, transportation, security personnel, etc. Uh, promote the need for healthy li living and discipline through outreach programs and through technology, the use of social media as a means of communication, we can reach the masses. We need to clearly define priority areas to allow us to set realistic goals and objectives that are obtainable and plan for how we can manage these goals and set key performance indicators. Sponsorship and marketing. <coughs> As mentioned earlier, sponsorship has always been a challenge. With an attractive product, we can turn this tide around. Businesses want value for their money, and that we must provide. First, through a marketing director for the league, a strategy will have to be de developed that will deliver these benefits. We have to identify our key assets and possible revenue generating streams. The benefit of a semi-professional league is that it can provide a strong national team resulting from a high level of competition. The increased availability to tap into merchandising of our national, at our national level and within the clubs or franchises of the same league. The league must also be seen as a brand to attract television rights. This will greatly assist in the sustainability for many years to come. In the marketing strategy, identifying avenues for revenue streams and our match day experience is necessary, encouraging our fans to want to return every match. Communication. Communication is an integral part of the BFA's operation. We actually had a full-time communications officer um, employed. It's important in terms of crisis management, proper dissemination of information to the public, media houses, and other stakeholders, the use of our website and social media outlets have been able to engage fans all over the world and generate more interest in the sport. Our games are broadcasted live via television and YouTube and this broadcast will be a great asset to the semi-professional league as well. We also recognize that when it comes to communication, timing is everything, and the BFA in the past have been operating within a 
broadcast strategy which has shown some results. There is never an overload of information being put out at any given, at any given time. How the message is communicated is also important. We have a, a part-time graphic artist to ensure that we maintain a level of professionalism and attractiveness, and all important to the semi-professional league in order to attract and maintain interest in the product we supply. The timely dissem dissemination of games, scores, results, matters relating to the games, organization, man management of press conferences, handling me media relation related matters and announcement within the venue are all critical elements that could determine how well the league does. Regulations and procedures, as a result of a simple error by the BFA a few years ago, it, it costed our national team a chance to advance further in the qualifying stages of the World Cup competition. Unless persons are clear on what their rules are, simple mistakes can happen. The BFA hired a players and competitions logistics manager, and the role is to keep abreast of the changes and the requirements for national and international competitions, primarily. There are vast differences, and unless there is a const constant focus on matters like these, the BFA could find itself spending a lot of time fixing problems instead of pre preventing them. Then there's the legal side of things, players' contracts and club obligations. The players and competitions logistics manager must be in a position to provide the appropriate guidance and direction required. Procedures for how disputes should be handled will have to be clearly defined and matters pertaining to players and statutes including transfers and loans. At the moment, the only match the operations in it and events. At the moment, the only venue can guarantee for the semi-professional league is the Wildy Turf. While it is still not the ideal stadium, it provides a level of comfort that is acceptable for fans and players. The playing surface is artificial. It is still in immaculate condition, I, I should add. The recent addition of lights and bleacher seating makes it currently our football showpiece. We've gained vast experience in match day preparations from staging our local league and the CONCACAF Nations League tournament, the current ongoing Capelli Super Cup competition, in the current co ongoing Capelli Super Cup competition, we've tried to ensure that match days are conducted similar to CONCACAF Nation League matches. This gives the participating clubs a familiarity of what is required within a semi-professional environment. The media permanently separated from the players and officials area. A meeting was held with our sponsors, vendors to ensure that they arrive at, sorry, our vendors to ensure that they arrive at the venue before a specific time and to inform them of what their limitations were. Participating teams and refereeing officials must arrive at the venue at least one hour before the stipulated time for their match. Teams that do not adhere to these regulations are penalized financially. We've raised the level of our accreditation system. ID cards for players, officials must wear visible tags. We also have done the same for spectators, media, security, vendors, and grounds personnel with limitations to where they can access. Infrastructure and safety, infrastructure, safety, and development. The only venue the BFA can guarantee for games at is at our Wildy facility. This is because it has all the controls that are necessary for staging a semi-professional league at this time. Ideally, we'd like to be able to spread the league throughout the communi communities, but there are no other venues that allow us this level of control. We've requested ad additional field fields from government to be used as f football specific venues. However, if we were to receive these, it would take a few years to get them ready to the level that we want. Some of the procedures of the ability facilities includes scanning of players, officials, and fans who enter the venue. The police presence is, is always there as well as private security at all, all entrances, stands, and players area and we have an evacuation plan which we hope will prevent any injury or loss of life in the event of an incident. 
In conclusion, through the assistance of FIFA, CONCACAF, and commercial entities, government, schools, community partners, and other stakeholders, a semi-professional league for the BFA will become a reality. A semi-professional league would give football in Barbados a huge advantage and a constant push towards positive development while delivering a great experience for players and fans. We're not just existing to develop football, but we exist also to mold young minds in unity, camaraderie, and discipline. It is important that we recognize that, and through this exercise, we foster, foster human values and afford them opportunities while enjoying the game. Better football for a better life. Thank you. No questions? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Edwin, for your right. comprehensive. Thanks for going through the. Why are you wearing, Edwin? <laughs> what? Uh, there was my wow. celebration cut short. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. So you went through the project in terms of the modules, which good job in, in outlining the modules. Um, but. Was there a budget? How exactly are you going to, to do this establishment of the semi-professional league? What, what, what is the whole to? Well, we've not determined yet um, how, or at least what, what format we'll go with, uh, whether it be franchises or if we'll go with clubs. That will determine the budget, obviously. Um, if it's franchises, then obviously you need to target people that can actually um, purchase or manage a franchise, clubs. If it's clubs, then we would need to support clubs. Um, that part of it we've not determined. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you, first of all, for the presentation. Um, my question is, uh, you had outlined very well um, the project and what we have in mind. Um, the question is simple. Well, when do you plan to establish the league? What is the deadline you have in mind? 2022. Okay. Any questions for th from the peers? Um, I noticed what you said one of the areas of concern was the category of players. You know, there is this stigma around them. Is it high risk um, uh, persons? What, what are the mitigating risk factors you put in place for that type of thing? Um, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a bit difficult and it has been difficult because um, you see, if, if, to explain it, if, 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 if an incident happens around football or come into football, you always hear, let's say there's a shooting while somebody's coming to football. You hear uh, somebody got shot at football. It's not necessarily at football, but it's somebody that was coming to football. You know what I'm saying? Um, we've been trying to promote a different brand of football and trying to let people know that it is a societal issue as opposed to just a football specific issue, you see. Um, it's difficult to, 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 to come back, but we've, we've been trying to work with it. Uh, we've been trying to, to let people know that it's more of a societal issue than just football specific. Our followers are, are from, from, from like, um, our followers are from the people that has guns and <laughs> and those kind of things, but these don't necessarily happen at football. Um, so it's difficult, but we've been trying to get people to recognize that that is not the case. Okay, so it's branding. To rebrand yourself. 
Yeah. Um, just uh, an overall comment. I, I, like Stacy said, you covered all the topic. What you need to concentrate on is the how. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do some of these things? I think just that's the gap right there in information. You have yeah. the outline and you have your idea. You have to go into the how in each element, like the rebranding of your players, um, where you're going to get your fund, especially you mentioned sponsorship and funding and finance and the struggle of it. How are yeah. you going to solve that? You don't have to answer it. I think when, you, when you're looking to really push the project to the implementation side, you have to get down into the how. Okay? But we actually uh, reached out to CONCACAF. Um, I had a conversation with Christian on, um, you know, how, or at least what is the best way to go about it. And if we use examples, maybe like uh, maybe in Mexico or, or, or those persons that already have leagues going, maybe that will give us an idea of how we can structure ours going forward. Yeah. Edwin? Thank you. Oh. Um, just a oh. question here. Yeah. How will your, your players be paid? Would it be through gate receipts? Well, I would imagine if we decide to go with franchises, then the franchise would pay the players. Um, gate receipts, hopefully the numbers would come back that we're able to do a, make a contribution to the clubs. Uh, ideally, we would like to be able to spread the league around the island, uh, which would help a lot. But at the moment, we can only use the building facility. Um, if we have a match, maybe like in St. Lucie, and we have a franchise that's coming from St. Lucie, maybe they can control that venue and be able to take up and get receipts, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. But right now, everything is kind of centrally located and kind of coming through the BFA. That's part of our challenge. I'm asking also, will each franchise owner be asked to pay any fees? Well, we haven't determined which direction we're going, if we're going um, franchise or if we're going through the club format. That's still to be de determined. As I mentioned, uh, we've reached out to CONCACAF for some advice on which, which way is the best way forward. And I guess based on, 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 on that, we'd be able to say, well, okay, the franchise format or club format. Thank you very much. Okay. So we will have Trinidad and Tobago.
Association. So I mean, you can talk on here. They already messed my time enough. Don't worry, I'm a presentation, but it's short as a minute. Okay. I, de I am depending on you. Call them back now. Right, I think I'll only listen here as we go.
Hello, everyone. We are ready to resume. Okay, so we are gathering again. We're doing very well on time, except Trini time have to step in. Right, Trini? Of course. Very good. So um, we'll just start in a couple of minutes. Okay, so we'll start now. Good morning, everyone. I am Sharon O'Brien. I'm Kamara David. And we are here to present our goal for 2020 and our, as our final project for the FIFA CIS executive program. Our goal for 2020 is to host an under 17 girls youth invitational tournament. This, in this tournament, we intend to invite some of the four, some of the top women footballing nations in the Caribbean and South America. So, Jamaica, we are coming at you, Haiti, and Venezuela to compete in the tournament in 2020. Just to give a quick uh, overview of how the presentation will run, uh, we'll start with the rationale and objectives, and then we'll, touch on, we'll try to touch on the topics that we learned throughout the course, the governance and FIFA forward program, administration and finance, project management and strategy, marketing, sponsorship and communication, regulations and procedures, match operations and facilities management, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Sorry. With the rise of women football in the Caribbean, as we can all see over the years, we chose to do this tournament. Um, the CONCACAF Under-17 tournament will be hosted next year. And in order to prepare our team and assist the other Caribbean teams in, in this tournament is the reason why we decided to host this tournament. And we can see from Haiti in 2018, making it to France on the 20 World Cup, to Jamaica in 2019, we see that women football is coming and rising. And the ultimate goal for the TTFE is to qualify for the women under 20 World Cup in 2022, under 20 World Cup, sorry, and the women's World Cup in 2027. Thank you. So, in governance and FIFA forward program, in terms of governance, uh, we will definitely need to get the Congress approval, and this will be done uh, through the budget. So, the Board of Directors of the TTFA will put together the budget uh, in conjunction with the General Secretariat, and then we will have to go to the uh, Congress in November 2019 to approve the budget. So, the total association budget will include the budget for the tournament. Committees will be involved uh, in our constitution. There is a women's football committee, a youth football development committee, and also an organizing committee for TTFA competitions. So in an advisory role, we'll have the committees of the TTFA as per our constitution involved. We know uh, part of FIFA's uh, 
reform principles. One of them is the promotion of women in football. By hosting this tournament, we will take a holistic approach in this aspect. Of course, we have the girls playing football, and then we would have the referees who we would have around the region being female involved in the tournament, and of course, uh, women coaches for the various national teams. The FIFA Forward uh, 2.0 uh, project has helped us and will help us to host these tournaments. As, we may, as most of you guys may know, we are building a hotel accommodation at our uh, FA, including three additional uh, training fields. So with this, we can house all the PMD participating member association, as well as uh, have fields ready for them to train logistically. This will help us in terms of the field and the accommodation uh, just a few seconds away from each other. And then we have the girls' national teams. Uh, according to the regulations of the FIFA Forward 2.0, uh, an additional 50,000 is given to MAs that um, has an active girls' national team in two categories. So we'll not be only helping the TTFA, but the other participating member associations as well in achieving this objective. In terms of administration and finance, we have an exclude of the, uh, the budget that we uh, allocate towards the tournament. In previous incarnations of the tournament, we had accommodation, transportation, and meals taking the bulk of the budget. Now with the, uh, the advent and the use of the FIFA Ford project and the opening of our home of football, we would see that the transportation is basically cut to 1%, which is basically taking the teams from the airport to the accommodation, and accommodation and accommodation as well will be cut drastically in that they will be staying at our, our uh, facilities. It's just the operations cost we'll have to cover. Meals, um, meals will be cut as well, but of course, uh, feeding the four teams, all their staff and the officials, it will be the, uh, the, the major cost in our expenses. Moving on to our projected income, we uh, expect to get grants uh, from the Ministry of Sport as it has also helped in the past and also, as you'll see later on in our sp uh, sponsorship package, we would, we would hope to get some sponsors on board. Uh, historical data tells us that ticket sales will uh, be just over 10% and of course we want to do live streaming again, which will uh, be a paid per view and we will ju get just over five uh, 5,000 US. So if you look at the expenses and the, the total expenses and the total income, we see we just got a small profit of over just 2,000 US, which will cover any contingencies that come up uh, through the hosting of the event. In terms of resources that we plan to use for this tournament, we have human resources and physical. In terms of human resources, we plan to use volunteers, which will decrease the cost of paying anyone to, much, to work at this tournament. So usually in the past, we use UUE sports management volunteers to assist us in whatever area we may request from them. Uh, the ball attendants and flag bearers are usually, we usually use girls football teams from the various schools that will get them involved and also see the, where, how far they can reach in football and, and um, idolize those of them who they watch on the field and security personnel. In terms of phys physical resources, as, we, as you saw, we have our players accommodation, the home of football, the training fields where we have three training fields that will be used for the teams to train and we have the stadium, everything located at the same venue and equipment that will also be in place for the tournament. And as Kamara said earlier, we have three committees that deals with competition in the TTFA, two, one mainly for women football and one for youth development and also we have a competitions and tournament committee. They will serve as the advisory board to the LOC which will be running this tournament to make sure we have everything in place and running um, smoothly. Under the LOC, we will have different um, groups to deal with different aspects of the tournament. 
Um, we have accreditation and ticketing, hospitality. We'll have certain people dealing with that along with volunteers, marketing, TV, media, match day venue, operations, tournament administration, and PMA team management, meaning logistics, um, laser officers that will deal with the teams when they come into the country until they leave. Moving on to project management and uh, strategy, what we uh, what we did, we we created a, a Gantt chart, just to exclude from the uh, entire thing. So just to run through it quickly, uh, nothing could happen without the confirmation letters and contracts signed by the participating member associations. So that that would be the first one on the on your left. So after that is done, as a key milestone task, then it is that we could confirm fixed years do the flight itineraries and set all the training schedules, right? So once fixtures are confirmed, then we could go, go on to the artwork. However, getting the flight itinerary, as we can see here, and the training schedule, it doesn't affect us in creating the, uh, the design for the artwork or confirming the fixtures. Once the artwork is confirmed, we go on to the media launch and we do ticket sales, send out VIP uh, in invitations and all, and all these things. So the Gantt chart just shows the relationship as to when certain things would, uh, would be done and what has to wait on what, and then it also would tell you the critical part as to how long the tournament would take and how long all the, the tasks will take to achieve. Then uh, as the association is going through major restructuring, we took out a strategic concept that we would look at in, in completing the uh, in hosting the tournament with the vision statement of football for the future. And of course, with that, as we trickle along the objective, the strategic objective, as Sharon said earlier, is to qualify for the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup. The action step we will take to do that is, of course, hosting the, uh, the invitational tournament. In terms of marketing, sponsorship, and communication, we would basically have two sponsorship packages uh, available. We have the Platinum Sponsor Package and the Gold Sponsor package in the platinum category we will only sell two of these packages uh, the main difference is that in the platinum will be exclusive category meaning that if it is that we target and we get a sponsor any telecommunications company let's say traditionally let's say we get B mobile then B mobile will have all the rights in the telecommunications strategy on the other side in the in the goal in the goal sponsor package where is non-exclusive uh, we'll be really targeting brands to help us cut our costs. So let's say dry good brands, so like rice, um, flour mills, and these local brands to help us uh, to get the raw ingredients for, uh, for making the meals and stuff, right? So however, if it is these, these, this package is non-exclusive, so if you get sunshine snack nuts or something like that, it doesn't mean that the nuts man can come and sell in the stadium. Uh, of course, we'll be using the, the traditional uh, social media platforms as our target market is youth, uh, our youth. So we definitely will be doing different social media campaigns on the Instagram and the Facebook. And of course, we can't leave out the traditional marketing in terms of distributing flyers. We'll be using players on the team to go to the busy hubs across the nation to distribute flyers and all, and all these other things. regulations and procedures. As we invite the teams, we will, as Kamara said earlier, we will give them contracts. If we have any dispute at any of the contracts in the tournament, and being, a, the, being of an international nature, we plan to as have CAS assist us with the resolution of any issues. Also, we plan to have the teams to make sure they have insurance, we will also have insurance for our hotel to make sure it's covered in case of any issues at the hotel or at the fields. When having an international tournament, you need to get approval from CONCACAF and FIFA, so these state approvals have to be sought, so we plan to apply for application to host a tournament. Also, the teams will also have to do the same to apply to participate in the tournament. In all tournaments, you must have rules and regulations for the tournament to make sure the number of players, the size of the field, etc. 
and of course passport checks to make sure that the teams, the players on the teams belong to the countries involved. Of course, match day operations will take these, these things into consideration. We have accreditation, we'll have press, press conferences, flash interviews, sponsorship, etc., and plus the match day countdown. All right, for this tournament, we'll be using two sets of accreditation. As you can see in the background, we'll be using the accreditation passes uh, and also the bibs to give to people who are, are much more closer to the action, like the photographers, the medical personnel, and the different teams. Last but not least, we have the facility management, of course, ensuring that there's proper signage at the stadium uh, for patrons to know where tickets will be sold if they haven't purchased their tickets yet, the toilets, the exits, and the media passage. We also will have the scoreboard and the PA system to uh, communicate any sort of information, uh, important information. Um, notices, security, and safety brief. We'll have this before the, the match start, as we'll have monies being exchanged at the ticket booths. We'll have security assigned to each booth, ensuring that the security gates, uh, the, the exit gates are unlocked, um, communicating and listening with the stadium admin to ensure this, uh, this is uh, happening, and also ensuring that the lights come on as well. As the tournament will be three match days, ensuring that the, the, the facility is clean after each match day is key. So we definitely need to have a cleanup crew at the end so that we can restart for the next match day. Thank you. Any questions? The ball's supposed to be bouncing, eh? So that's why it's blocking, but technical difficulties. If you do have questions. I have a question, sorry. <laughs> so all four teams will be staying at the of the accommodation? Yeah. The hotel is a seventy two hotel seventy two room hotel. It could house at over close to two hundred and fifty to three hundred persons. So they'll be fostering a spirit of camaraderie while all then have to go play against each other. No problem. That's fine. Um, so what were your risks? I didn't quite get your risks, sorry. Is that, is that well, um, as we said, the strategic goal is to qualify for the, uh, the, under, the under 20 World Cup. So in doing all of this, if it is that we don't qualify, I mean, then the whole thing, I wouldn't say put our ways, but the, the goal really is to qualify to, for the World Cup. So by hosting the talk, tournament, we hope, and it's proven in the past uh, in other Emmys that by playing more international games, we, the team could be better able to qualify. What are the risks in hosting the tournament? Um, did you assess the risks in hosting? Well, there are a number of risks. Um, so if it is that teams can, so one of the risks, the teams could sign and they could not show up. Yeah. Um, so that could be a huge risk in that we had already published fixtures. We had it in the past with uh, we had it in the past already with flights in the Caribbean. We all know is a headache and a hassle, so that could be a curious and could possibly cause our tournament to not be up to the standard we want it to be. Right. So my question was, did you all do a risk assessment for it? Though? Um, like not not entirely, but we we uh, in the write up we we would plan to include it. Okay. No, as he mentioned, I wanted to know. Your selection of teams, mm -hmm. what was the criteria for using those teams? Um, well, we saw Jamaica recent success in qualifying and also Haiti as well. So we want to see as Caribbean, as Caribbean uh, neighbors, we want to see how it is that we, our level match up to the Jamaica and Haiti. And as well, Venezuela, they're also part of us now. <laughs> but it's easy, it's easy oh. to bring. <laughs> It's easy, it's easy to bring Venezuela. We have, a, we have a, a, a very good relationship with the Venezuelan FA in that we actually play uh, matches on an annual basis. So it's just good friendly to build the relationship better. And they also compete in the um, Comibol region. So they also compete at a high level. So it's good competition for us. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.
Just one thing I didn't notice, translators, if you're bringing in those two students, remember to make sure you have that there. Of course we will, if and I can translate. <laughs> the team liaisons will take care of that. We will have team liaisons to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. So we will bring Curacao. Good morning. Uh, welcome to um, our presentation. I'll be um, starting off the presentation. My name is Erica Weaver. We have uh, Viviana Reinschot and our other colleague, George De Wind. Uh, we will all be pres presenting a part of, the, um, of what we have entered and I will start with the introduction of the FFK vision, mission and implementation of infrastructure developments for obtaining our goals. Um, in this paper, we want to um, introduce our organization's uh, vision to implementation and transformation of the organi organizational structure and the concepts and actions we need to have in place to um, achieve the growth um, we have in mind. The vision of the um, FFK reads as follows. Developing football as a mean of improving quality uh, of life, good citizenship, and competing at the highest level of the confederation. That's a very important goal we have. And uh, for the mission, <laughs> we, want, uh, we want to ensure a proper environment for football development and participation and high performance, especially focused on um, maximizing grassroots and um, youth football performances, but also which will resort in um, forming or educating better individuals for the island. Our values, we focus a lot on the values we have, not only within our organization, but also uh, for the stakeholders we work with. Um, teamwork, we focus on teamwork um, so that we can unify and have a good cooperation towards our common goals. We want to work within our organizations, but also with the partners on trust. Um, our words and actions should be reliable. Um, integrity, ethical in decision making, and um, putting that into action. We should be reliable for our partners, but also uh, for our personnel. Accountability. We need to be responsible and committed to the tasks and actions and programs we put before us. Discipline. A positive and dedicated attitude. We need to be disciplined in all the tasks that we put before us, but also doing that with respect for each other. Acceptance and consideration of all individuals, personnel, but also others we work with. 
um, FFK stakeholders. Uh, we work with a lot of international stakeholders as um, all other uh, MAs. We have the FIFA, CONCACAF, CFU, but also the Caribbean and regional stakeholders. In our cases, a lot of the other islands like Aruba, Bonaire, St. Martin, that we work with closely and um, that most of the times we help organize their, um, their local, uh, their local uh, games, but mostly uh, coordinating also um, when they're hosting um, Nation League games. So not only uh, do we have the, um, the responsibility of our own MAs, but a lot of times helping our sister MAs also. Uh, furthermore, stakeholders, the local government, um, Department of Education and Sports, we have the social partners, we have uh, sport committees, commercial entities, clubs and schools, teachers, coaches, the leaders, volunteers, the parents and the players. Assessment of our co current situation. Um, with assessing our current situation, we must take into account the existing challenges of governance structure and organization. Allocating permanent administrative and technical staff is necessary. We have an organization where we do a lot of work but still need some personnel in place. Club licensing must be implemented within the organization, taking into account all the, con all the control mechanisms and adequate monitoring process that comes with it. Therefore, an internal digital platform and exter external communication platforms um, are essential and need to be in place. We need to take into account the training for um, the, st the stakeholders and clubs. Our strong points. Yes, our strong points. We have a sound, um, basic organizational structure. Um, we have a, uh, effective organizational uh, uh, competitions that are in, in place, experience and competent technical department. We have good infrastructure and equipment. Uh, functional control mechanism and monitoring, um, good performances performing senior team um, in the CFU and CONCACAF region. Our opportunities, um, we need a, a new government's body, new strategies and uh, review the organization. We need to be upgrading administrative and technical staff, professionalizing club licensing and uh, we need professional control mechanism and monitoring um, mechanisms. Internal digital platform and communication platforms. Training for key stakeholders and club are, clubs are very important in this process and we see that as opportunity in upgrading our organization. We have um, for this presentation highlighted, especially um, to be focusing on our infrastructural development, which George will follow um, through on. We have identified um, with the goals and objectives also our um, strong points, but our weaknesses also, which we need to, um, which we need to address um, in the uh, mission we have in, in growing. So to, um, to grow, we need, 
we need to be administratively structured, deliver on talent and services, and focusing on the infrastructural developments that we're doing now and that George will follow up on. We have just selected a new board. Um, that was a week ago. And um, from the average um, uh, age of 65 years plus, we are now to an average age, age of 45 plus. And that's uh, a great advantage in the creative, innovative, and um, new, um, the new direction we want to be uh, going to. So from paper to paperless organization, um, if we can achieve that, that will be part of the transformation. Thank you. George. Good morning, everyone. Okay, FFK main project is to transform our field into a 4,500 fans stadium. By doing this, we can improve the match experience we can improve the match experience, we can play domestic and international matches, improve the image of the MA, generate revenues, as well as generate employment opportunities. This is because of the magnitude of the, of the stadium in our country, which is a small one. This is the master plan of what we have expected to construct. We have already renovated our turf, that is, we have a new one. We have already built our dressing rooms, we are building, now we are going to build our VIP lunch and then our bleachers. And this starting is supposed to be finished by, finished by um, January 21st. Okay, we have split the project into several sub-projects, which consists of dressing rooms project, which is already completed, artificial turf renovation, already completed, bleachers and VIP lunch, are in process. We have budgeted for every single project its particular amount. You can easily see that. And we can see that we are more in the range, more or less in the range that the suppliers provide their, provide their offers. Based, based on good government practice, every single sub project has been reviewed, approved, and communicated to the Congress. We have, also communica we, we have also communicated to the Congress that FIFA will cover 100% of the finance of the construction of this field. The construction of the v VIP launch, after the design was totally complete, we create a package for the tenders which includes written scope of work, floor plans, facade, doors and windows, the doors and windows we want, the electric drawing, and etc. Tender process. FFK estimates for the VAP to be completely done. Estimation was of 190,000 US. Here we, here we can see what the, what the tenders offer. It was higher than what we expected. We evaluated it and negotiated with the, with the um, suppliers. Then the price dropped. This is, this is a table how every single supplier was evaluated, and you can see how the prices dropped from 195 till 185,000, more or less 500,000 less than one, what we expected. Betom Betombo, of course, that is the name of the company which win the offer, the, um, the project for the VIP. Based on no, legal expect. A contract for agreement was signed by every single supplier selected, as well by FFK. This was to recognize rights and duties for every, of every single entity. We can see some elements that we it, um, put into the um, contract. For example, scope of work, duties, risks, time of complexion, price, etc. The dressing room drums, the dressing rooms were supposed to be done in nine months, artificial turf, turf two months, bleachers nine months, VIP lunch four months. If we, if we can do it in those months, 
we are finished by January 21st. Okay, no? Good morning. Good morning. Um, after the construction of the first phase of um, our facilities, um, we had to inaugurate them, and on August 9, we had the honor to receive the president of FIFA, Mr. Gianni Infantini. We came to Curacao with the delegation of FIFA to inaugurate our new facilities. Um, we prepare a very warm welcome for him with some local foods, local music, so they can have a taste of our beautiful island. And then they had a tour in our offices, and then we went down to the um, um, new facilities so that he can cut the ribbon, as you can see in the picture, in front of the um, governance of Curacao, the representative, um, the board of FFK, the employees, and everyone who came to see this big moment for us. We were very proud of this big achievement because it, it means a lot of us because it will be of, it will lead to the improvement of football on Curacao. Um, after that, um, they give a press conference to the local press so they can um, know what we are um, going to do, going to achieve for um, our country. Um, as George said, we are um, going to build 4,500 seats for our fans, and of course we had um, games, um, around of 900 games per year in our stadium. Um, so we will have a lot of visitors, players, fans who will come um, at our stadium. That's a great opportunity to attract um, potential um, people, investors, um, sponsors to promote at our stadium. We will use a few methods of promotions like our walls, flags and banners, scoreboard, field, sideboards and benches to promote uh, service or a company. This is an example of our walls. This is our main, main sponsor, the MCB Bank, so they can put um, paintings or drawings at our walls. Um, we can hang flag, flags and banners during games so people notice your company or service. At the scoreboard, we can put a name of a certain company. Um, the field sideboard is one of the most common way that we used to um, promote. Um, with logos or um, pictures of a um, company. And at the benches, we can put different advertisements as well. We created sponsorship packages to attract our sponsor. We have the platinum, the gold, and the silver package, each one with their benefits. Of course, the platinum will get the most benefits of all with signage at our school board, flags and banners, painting on our wall, field sideboard, ads at our benches, and free pass to our games at the, our VIP launch. The gold package is the second con um, category with less benefit than the platinum, of course, but they will get paintings on our walls, flags, field sideboards, and free enters of our, on our games, and the last one, the silver, package will also um, have painting on our wall, field side boards, and free enter to our games. Um, we will have a large um, visitors, a large amount of visitors in our stadium and also around our stadium. This, that is a benefit for us and we will use it to market um, our stadium with the use of the social media pro um, platforms that we have like Facebook page, our Instagram and our website and we also will um, use the traditional media like newspapers, television, radio and so on to um, market our facilities because the main event of our field will be football games but we also um, offer um, a lot of other activities that can be um, use at our um, stadium, like um, family days, birthday parties, 
um, team buildings and schools, we organize outdoor sport events. So we will um, attract and um, get more type of customers to invest in our um, new facilities. All this to, the, um, to get more funds, of course, and to help to develop um, the football in Curacao. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? I have a question. Um, I noticed your bleachers has come up to 900,000 for, for 45 seats. Was that correct? Can you repeat your question? Please? The bleachers. I think I saw a price of what, 900,000 for 45 seats? 4,500 seats? That was in the first instance. Okay. Uh, first instance, and that was the highest uh, uh, bid offer we had. Mm -hmm. But of course, we went with the lower, lowest one but also with the organization, the company, that had, has more experience in um, providing features and they had the lower offer. And um, also, George, can you fill in? But I think it, that is not for the bleachers, that's for the VIP, what was we paying? No, the VIP the was 180 lunch. something thousand, I think, yeah. so. And we okay, all right. Um, how was the timeline established? What? The timeline. You had two months for this? Timeline yes. How was it established? How did you come up with those timelines? Okay, because um, we have, sorry, we have an architect that designed their, um, the master plan, and he also um, said what time, what the date, what the date um, every uh, sub project should be done. And we had a coordinator um, that, uh, um, that makes sure the plan gets executed as we Um, I have a question. Well, first of all, thank you um, for presenting the project. My question is, um, you highlighted very well um, the budget, how the, the cost of the project. My question is, uh, is this um, facility um, supposed to generate revenue in, in the long term? generate revenues. Okay, and do you, can you explain how you see okay. that? Yes, of course. By the selling of tickets and by the, by the marketing and promotion, of course, and as, as Livina said, we are, we are going to sell our walls for the, um, for the entity, for the companies, for the sponsorship. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just a little advice as you move forward. Um, you should add in an operational budget um, that would really bring that point, generating revenue, to life. Okay. So you're able to identify the money that you propose to generate through your um, selling of your boards and your bench and all the advertising. And then, of course, you'd also want to show how much money you'll be spending um, to operationalize your, your building on a monthly or annual basis. Okay? okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. So next is Aruba. Okay. 
Yes. Hello. Good morning. Um, as I see during the day, I said I saw a lot of most of us dedicate one of other some time on infrastructure. So I won't be the difference. <laughs> I also uh, the, the, our, our MA also also has a problem with infrastructure. So basically, when I started as a general secretary and um, I did my round of meetings with the departments, especially the competition department and the technical department, I came very soon to the conclusion that we have a serious issue. And the issue is we have not good stadiums and nor good football fields. There's a lack of maintenance on those on the island. And for sadness of all, in 2018, our stadium, or we had two grass field stadiums, uh, artificial turf stadiums. Both of them has been denied or didn't get the approval of CONCACAF to have international games on them. So by sitting there down and looking into all these issues, um, and when this course came up, I. I took it immediately, I embraced it and make myself to, uh, let's write down something on paper and try to come up with a plan, hopefully a solution, uh, and hopefully something that we can sustain for the coming years. So by going through the um, strategic plan, um, it's based on six pillars. Five of these pillars has a direct relationship with good fields, infrastructure, and if we want to complete those actions, we need to have a, a solid base of infrastructure. In the governance, we need to have a solid relationship with the stakeholders, especially with the government and the foundation who's managing the stadiums because we don't have any stadiums. We are renting stadiums, but we don't are we are not the sole renter. Everybody on the island can rent the stadium. <laughs> they don't have consideration for the big user like us that we held all our games there, and we do only soccer. But it's been rent to hockey, to rugby, to the clubs itself who want to play on artificial turf and train on artificial turf, and to the private soccer academies. Two weeks ago, I got a telephone call from the foundation who managed the stadium, and they told us that we have to take consideration also for the 50-plus football league. They also want to rent the stadium. So there is a, a quarrel about who uses, when to use it. It's not well managed. And besides it, those stadiums weren't good maintained since it's a foundation. They, don't, they get the funding from the lottery but um, I think the overhead expenses are too high, so they don't rest money to maintain the stadiums. Youth football, we want to promote youth football, but to promote it, you need to have fields to get them. At this moment, we're doing the youth football program will start in, in November, and we have done it after school, because on a later hour, we cannot get the stadiums to, 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 to keep those training for the football school. Football for all, we go into the schools, we created a program to to start a, a league of 20 schools, um, um, middle schools, that we can they can have a tournament, especially for girls. But we have to make sure that the fields that they're using are, are staying near the schools are okay, or the school itself has a field that we can use, because it's much better in accommodation and the facility itself to help to get this program. This is also an after school program because on a later hour it's going to be difficult to schedule it. Um, clubs and leagues, obviously our own competition, we have problems getting it. We cannot schedule a whole year competition. It's scheduled by quarter and, and we still depend that they can cancel game on us and rent it to somebody else. And and for our national team is the same thing. We try to get a schedule to make an optimum training, but it's not possible. So as we can see, a great part of the 
of the strategic pillars are depending on infrastructure. What we have, I have done was I created four, yeah, four projects that we think we, we have to build on and to make ourselves optimum and, and get our football fields in order so we can enhance the game and building a, a stronger yeah, uh, environment to work on and to develop. Our first project is the rebuilding of the stadium, France Figueroa. We have two stadiums, but one of them, it's, it, the maintenance is so bad that we cannot, um, it's too expensive to rebuild the stadium because we have to throw down half the part of the stadium and rebuild it again, so that's a big, very big work. So we concentrated on the second stadium, which is close by our technical center. And by doing this rebuilding, we can achieve to get back our, get the approval to get our nation games back on the island, the international games back on the island. The second is we're rebuilding a, a stadium that we, it's a youth stadium that was financed by FIFA a couple of years back, but the project never finalized. It keeps talking. And um, when I did inspection on the stadium, I came to the conclusion that my advice was to the board was to let's, let's enhance, let's um, implement the usage agreement and take over that stadium and start with it. Otherwise, there, there will be some minor changes on it or minor maintenance work will have to be done. The biggest one we have to leave for, for the coming years, but but we can start it, we can use it, we can make it our own stadium. The third project will be building two community fields. When we were in Suriname during the infrastructure program, we got acquainted with a, a new form that you can build football fields for communities, which is a, a stadium-like sta <laughs> stadium -like fields, but more openly and in a cheaper way to to have a field and to enhance the football. And the third one, that was one of my own ideas that I firmly believe in, is that we need to help the clubs maintain their field. And there, in there, there are several other reasons that I think I believe that we have to do it, but on, when we go on, we will go more deeply into it. Rebuilding France Figueroa Stadium. This is a must-do project for FIFA. Okay, from our funds that we receive from FIFA, FIFA have put one condition. We need to have our own stage, bottom line. The only way the funds can go is infrastructure. So we started conversation uh, in May with the foundation to get acquainted with them what situation we are, because since last year that CONCACAF didn't approve the stadiums, we got a grace period, but the stadium is not ours. So we try to push them to what we're going to do or how we're going to help this, because this year we're going to have Nation League. And quite surprisingly, the Nation League games, instead of three games, became seven games. So since we don't have the stadiums, we need to go to abroad to host our game. And that's a lot of money. And I think it's put a lot of pressure, even flying between the Caribbean to get to the games put a lot of pressure and imagine that you have to host the game outside of your country so it was very difficult but we we went and talked with them in in principle we thought it was a very good conversation <laughs> we thought we had convinced them that um, we come in with the money you just have to give me the rent and we built it but some people seems to be they don't like the money or they don't need the money, but I think they want the power. But unfortunately, we are ended in a deadlock. We are still negotiating or restarting the negotiation again because now through the government, put pressure on the foundation that we need to come to a usage agreement because the foundation cannot um, rebuild the stadium. We have the funds to rebuild the stadium. So we need to work together to get a usage agreement so we can implement the stage. And the rebuilding of the stadium, in this case, is, is consists the biggest, two biggest costs are the 
renovation of the turf, and the lighting system. So we will, uh, we, we will have to debate, we will have to continue. We didn't, we prepared a, a budget and start continuing working and preparing the work even we didn't have the agreement yet on the stage. On the rebuilding side, um, we, I went and, and take inspection on, on this stadium. It's a youth stadium. Um, youth, I mean, is you can play games up to 15 years. U15 can play games, but it's a training facility. Any, any team can use it for training, including the national team. So what we have to do is when we inspect, there is some construction default, but that's, that's a big one, so it doesn't affect the field itself and the game. It's more spectator side, the fences, where they had put it. That cost we, we put aside. We, we can use the stadium. We don't really need that part that big at this moment. There's some small repair on the drainage station, put a scoreboard and put a backstop. So it's, it's small maintenance, but we can get. With this also, we got in problem because this stadium is managed by the lotto itself. And we start conversation with them, but we sign a, a usage agreement, but they don't want to implement the usage agreement. So we are in a legal quarrel. We don't want to get in legal quarrel. We, we stated them back that let's sit down and let's talk and let's solve this issue. Besides that, now we want to build two community fields um, on, on the island, on, on two separate parts of the island. These community fields will help AVB especially to not depend only on stadiums, but with this community field, you can help games in it and try to bring back the community to the games. So it's, for us, it's very important to do this and um, we can have our competitions are on, the, on the lower leagues competition and the youth competition. We can take it out of the stadiums and put it on these fields and I think we will attract and build the community to come back to the games and, and have games into their own community. Um, the total cost for these three projects is estimated of 2.7 million, of which the big part is its turf, lighting, fences, bleachers, so we divide it up and um, this is what we expect to cost. Um, we build the VBS the VBS, we did it in two sections. One, we did for planning, because we, we did the planning to get the proposals, uh, check the offers, choose which one we go and get approval from FIFA. And for the second one, was mostly execute, is the execution of the project. We did the, the past. Obviously, the past will show that for most of the thing, this is this, all these projects are benefit for the country, for the government, for the federation. Um, so we did a risk matrix for this, and I want to concentrate mostly on, on two risks that is very important that we are running. One of them is the political risk. As you may know that in many projects that people start a project with, most of them will get stuck on the finance and not on the project. Financing a project is usually the most difficult part. In our case, we don't see the finance as the difficult part, but the most difficult part is the political. Because we need to have to get approval of the government, we need to get the approval or the usage agreement for those stadiums, we need to get the land for the government to build the community fields. So we see it, the political risk is very big in here. We're trying to talk with them and help them and try to bring our message as, as clear as possible and the needs that we need we have and to realize this. The other risk I see is the timing risk. We start the conversation, I think, early this year in view of the Nation League games that we had in, in September, October, November. Unfortunately, we didn't succeed, so the timing risk is always there with every project. Besides that, we are on an island. We don't have anything. We need to import most of the things. So even if we choose to buy the grass, bring the building material, everything has a time on it, extra time on it that you don't concede. Because even if you plan that 
pulling out the grass and putting the grass back, it work itself. It may be two months, but I have to wait six weeks for the grass to come back in the island, so you're already sitting on three months, three and a half months. Besides the, the cost of the project, what we did was, our, was that we put also the operational cost in it, because mostly when you do a project, people forget about the operations. They only put in money for the, the cost of the building, but there's some operational cost, and what we try to do is we try to just do, to identify those costs and put a, a price on it. Maintenance of the field club. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have on the island is that the government, since there's a lack of land to build on housing on the island or commercial, any field that is not used will be confiscated. So we had an issue this year that the government had took uh, one field over and had built a residential area of, out of it. It was clear, the land was clean, just make it clean, it's already level up, it's easy to build a couple of, I, I don't remember, it's 25 lots are, but they had to use the land for building the, the residential area. So they brought us, the, in, in May, we did a survey on all the fields that we have on the island. And we, did, we identified that from the 26 club, um, 16 fields were okay, approved to play on, that the, everything is okay. Nine of them need to get the maintenance. The field is not okay. Six of them, we need to do something with the lighting. They have the lighting, but maybe they're not functioning, the electricity, but they have whatever reason. So what we did, we did a very comp comprehensive inventory to identify all this issue. But um, basically, is what, what we want to achieve at the end, and this is a long-term project, is what I did, or what, when I was part of my club, what we did was um, the football organization that I was a member with existed already since, 50, I think, 58. So it has about, at that time, 40 years <laughs> in, the, in um, existing. But the field wasn't good. They didn't have facility. They didn't have anything. So I came from the community center. At that time, I was president of our community center. What I did was I went to the, this football club and sit with them and tell them, listen, let's make an agreement. Trespass, you trespass the land to the community center. The community center will rebuild the field for you, and you're going to be the usage of the field. And this will take burden of the football of the club itself. To, to the only thing they have to do is develop football in the community. So I think the same concept the AVB should be approaching is that get those lands to be from AVB, and AVB will help develop those lands, make those fields correct, and the team will be usage of it. And that will prevent in any near future that a team can, cannot be active and whenever they don't get active, that they can't pick up the piece of land and take it away because it's difficult to get land back for doing the sports. In conclusion, um, we are still working. Hopefully the meetings will be starting back next week. And I think this time we, we have a more convinced that we can cross the bridge together with the government and with the, with the foundation that manages the stadium to come to a, a good end and that we can start investing the money that we have in this project. I, use a, I like to use codes, and I think this code will be an ideal one. First, have a definite, clear, practical ideal, a goal and objective. Second, have the necessary means to achieve your ends, wisdom, money, material and methods. Third, adjust all your means to that end, Aristoteles. That's obviously at the end, if you don't, I don't see it here, okay. This is a penalty kick that should be, but if you don't have your fence correctly secured for the field, things can happen. And this is one that had happened on our field. <laughs> so. Don't get me wrong for this. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you. <laughs> It's a, it's a true, it's a, it's a true story. It's a, you can see it. It's filmed on a, on a telephone, and it happened on the soccer field that we built. Uh, that I was part of this club when we, we built it. They had sent it to me a couple of months back. I think in February they sent me this, and I had kept it because <laughs> this is when you don't prepare, you feel correctly. <laughs> uh, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> they, they, I think they left the door open. They left the door open. <laughs> I think the counter team. The counter team had let the dog come in, come in. <laughs> um, I have a, it's not, it's not a question, it's a suggestion maybe. Um, first, thanks. Um, the presentation shows very well the challenges you're facing. Uh, in terms of presentation of the project, what I can suggest maybe is to add a SWOT analysis because that will show the, 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 the why, actually. Okay. I mean, uh, consolidate all that you said, and then we can find in the presentation in a single visual um, could be maybe more effective. It's just a suggestion because all the elements are there but maybe to consolidate that. Okay. Um, other than that, I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, very nice presentation. I like the um, connection with all your points as, as it relates to facilities and it impacts every a aspect of developing football. So we'll now have um, U.S. Oh, we're not here? Okay, so next would be BVI. So Antigua is not next? No? They switch. Oh, okay. No, we didn't switch. We just used the BVI for the USVI. We are still the Virgin Islands, right? Oh, we have okay. Each other's back. Good morning, everyone. As, and as you rightly heard, I'm representing the Virgin Islands, specifically the British Virgin Islands. And uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about academy development in the British Virgin Islands. As the BVI has been The BVI has been striving on its youth development for the past decade or so. And uh, we have seen improvement in many areas. 
But the trend we realize needs to be broken as um, some of the, some things need to be broken. There are some ad hoc activities and events unplanned and as a result, cost has increased and uh, we have not re realized the results. So we have taken a look into that and uh, we want to revamp our youth development program in terms of developing our youths so that we can maximize results because we know that there are potentials in the British Virgin Islands unlike what is being seen over the past few years. So we have a vision to provide a distinctive pathway from grassroots to the highest level with adequate resources and support that will help develop their talents to produce vibrant national teams which um, will, be, will be participating in local, regional, and international competitions. Our broad mission is to promote, encourage, regulate the game, to organize competitions in all its forms, and to authorize selections for national leagues, re regional and international, and to organize educational programs for coaches and other stakeholders. Now we have done a SWOT analysis and we look at our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. For strengths, <coughs> FIFA and CONCACAF has provided resources for all MAs, and we are grateful that we can capitalize on that also. We have youth, young talents who we can mold. We have access to the schools in the British Virgin Islands, and one of our major pillars is the after-school program. For weaknesses, lack of structured training. Playing standards and performances are very low at times. We have lack of quality competitions and that would be a result of proper planning. Lack of communication. We have poor marketing publicity which ties with communication also. Lack of qualified coaches, not that they are not qualified coaches in the British Virgin Islands. But we realize that when we provide these programs, some people actually take the programs, I think it's just a matter of they want something on the resume. It's like, okay, I have done this, but what are you doing with it? You are not contributing back to the, to the association. So realize that has been happening over the past years, and uh, we are going to do something about it rather than having them take the program and exit we want to make sure that they contribute back to the program. And we have limited pool for selections, and that is because of the de demographic of the British Virgin Islands. It's the melting pot of the Caribbean. <coughs> and we all know the, the rules and regulations for FIFA in terms of participating in international competitions. For opportunities, we can participate in youth tournaments, um, increase funding from FIFA, we know that the money is there, so it's a matter of doing what we have to do to get it. New government interests. We now have a new government and realize that they are more sport oriented. So we can capitalize on that also. Opportunities for all year round training programs. Football also has career opportunities and scholarships are be, can be offered. Threats. Sometimes you are focused on, more focused on international and seniors than actually having the pathway for the, for the youths to develop upwards. And there is the homophobic, well we know what that is, and that hinder the girls because some parents decide that this thing is going on now in football and I don't want my daughter to be a statistic. And that, is, that has put pressure on the women's program Competing in other sports, now we know track and field has taken leap and bounds, and Cindy BVI has won gold medals. Most, a lot of the young people are swarming into track and field, and we have lack of facilities. With the only stadium that was in the BVI, our good friends Oma and Maria decided that they want a piece of it, so they destroyed peace and le left the remnant, which we cannot use right now. Oh, um, 
sorry, our broad goal, the goal for Technical Academy's project is to develop players to have a larger pool for selection for local, regional, and international matches. This project specifically targets youths, boys and girls, and coaches residing in the British Virgin Islands with national heritage so that they can contribute to the improvement of the game region, regionally, internationally, and eventually qualifying for the World Cup. Yes, we are, we are dreaming big. For our specific, sorry, 2026. <laughs> Our specific objectives in order for us to realize our goals. Training coaches to meet the needs of the BVI Football Association. Create academies to identify talents. Supply academies with coaches and with advanced equipment and methods of training. And we realize that some of the coaches who were from the 70s, they still hold on to that specific method. You know that the old school your grandma say, this is the way to do it and you're not gonna do it anyway. You know, some people are not adapted to change. So we want to have something that is, you know, the trend of the market now. Football is evolving. So we want to make sure that our coaches have the latest in terms of skills and technology. Organize annual competitions to meet FIFA 2.0 requirements. And as I said, our because of the the size of our nations, we have not been able to meet some of those requirements, So, but we are heading in that direction. To supply a larger pool for national team selections. And we look at the major demands. What are our needs right now? We need great, we need more structured and consistent training. Um, over the past years, realize that it has been the trend that the teams will be training because a, a national or international competition is coming up a few months down the road. And after that competition, then there's no training. So there needs to be consistency if you want to see results. Also the demand and better quality, demand for more and better quality competitions to meet FIFA forward, of course, the benchmark that is locally. We need to be consistent. I'm sorry, there's repetition there. Better results would help us to shift our ranking in the FIFA and CONCACAF tables. And also need to invest in training and development of youth and coaches. Now for this project, we think about our staffing, which would have a project manager, technical director, head coaches, and other coaches, facility, facilitators for our workshops, administrative assistant that will help with the project. Some of our equipments that we need to source are goals, and you, you can see them there. Those are the basics in football development. Looking at our development plan, this will take four years, so we have four, four phases. And the first thing we're going to do is look at the recruitment of coaches. And we have to, because we, need, we want to start 2020, we have to start the process in 2019 so that we can have a good kickoff. So we recruit coaches, coaches sorry, we hold workshops, and we meet with principals and parents so we can sell our, our, what we are doing or sell our plan. And we source our equipment and materials. We monitor the school the schoolie because that is what we have going right now. And there's where we're gonna actually identify our talents so we can start the academy. Register the talented players for the, from the league. We implement the academies. We're gonna start with the two major, two main islands that is Total and Virgin Garda. We train our players and we have specific days, three days per week and because we have to meet the criteria for the 2.0, we still have to hold international and official friendlies. And uh, in, in recruiting more players, we, hold, we would hold summer camp. And we only have July because in August, most of the kids go off island. In the second phase, we evaluate what has done in the first year 
We continue our, our training. We extend the academy to one of the other islands. So, you know, we have a, a larger pool still. We will hold inter-school competitions. We will establish tournaments into two or three age groups, that is the under 17 and under 15. Because along each year we have to make sure that we meet the requirements for the 2.0. Even though we are still building, we have to meet our requirements so we can get the funding to continue this project. And it goes on to phase four. And you'll realize that the scope, we start at the first year, we would have 40% complete the second year 20 and so on for the budget I we did a uh, simple budget for the first year technical $160,400 utility maintenance 55 trading and, and office equipment 50 and administration 24 that's only for the first year because we don't know that we are going to you need all these for the second year and so on. So as the demand arises, then we'll make the changes. And for governance, we have already approved this project, having passed it to the Technical, technical Development Youth Development Committee, and it is approved by the EXCO, and now we will have to wait on the next, probably an extraordinary meeting for the council to be approved. And we have the imp implemental phases which we already looked at on that first slide. Now, in order for us to sell our product also, we, ha we come up with this marketing and st communication strategy. As we have done with our past school league, we compile sponsorship um, proposals. We have had some corporate sponsors, but because of the inconsistency, we have lost those sponsors except one. So we have to make sure we do that again and we have something compact so that our, our corporate sponsors will buy into it. So we have to make it very attractive. And we will use the billboards and social medias because we are actually targeting young people. Um, promote partnership branding. As you can see here, Adidas was one of our sponsors also. And we have video somewhere in there. And we have to make sure we connect with, uh, with the fans and the business businesses using our more talented players and actually sell them so that they can buy into it. And how would this impact our environment? We have lost the, the trust and confidence of the public, the fans and the businesses. So by these academies and the improvement of football, we would regain the trust of the public. We'll ha they, will have, they will have greater appreciation for football because football is not going to be seasonal anymore. It's going to be an all wrong event. It will just change the culture of football. In summary, in order for the BVI Football Association to experience meaningful improvement in the results and ability of our players and teams, by what we have researched there, we must raise the level of play and improve all competitions at local level. So we have to begin at home. This can be achieved through better structured youth development programs that concentrate on building youth organizations. And that is the reason why we established this or we undertake this project. Thank you. How does this project tie to BVI's strategic goals? Development, developing youth football is one of our ma major goals for the 20, for this cycle. Okay. Any other question? Thank you very much. Thank well you. done. So we'll invite Antigua.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning again. Good to see so many smiling faces. Like everybody has had some coffee. Are we all ready to go? Excellent. Um, my name is Rohan Hector. I'm the General Secretary of Antigua and Barbuda Football Association. Joining me is my colleague and great friend, I think, um, <laughs> Ms. Margaret Messiah, who is our financial controller. And we're going to take you through a process of where we are, we consider the most important aspect of the development of football in Antigua to be the development of our technical center. And so we're going to go through the how we arrived or how critical that, how important that is and why uh, we are where we are. And just some background information about the Antigua and Barbuda Football Association. It was founded in 1928, so we're just about, just over 90 years old. Um, and of course, we joined FIFA and CONCACAF in 1970. Um, the ABFA operates two main competitions, the League Cup and the FA Cup. Two main men competitions, sorry, and the Antigua and Barbuda Football Association's official season operates from September until February. The men's leagues are divided into three divisions. The Premier League is comprised of 10 clubs. The first division is comprised of 12 clubs, and the second division is comprised of 28 clubs. The female league has 10 teams, and the association also conducts U20, uh, U20, U15, and U13 youth leagues. Um, as with most of the Caribbean, the uh, football in Antigua trailed what was then the most popular sport of cricket for decades. And Antigua, because we have had some of the greatest cricketers, not only in Caribbean and West Indian history, but on the world stage, starting with us. <laughs> you see my good friend from Grenada is laughing because they can't quite claim the same. Um, but uh, the record speaks for itself. You know, we have had uh, much more than a dozen West Indian players. We've had perhaps some of the greatest, or arguably the greatest batsmen of all time. Trinidadians will disagree, but. So Vivian Richards, um, two of the greatest bowlers of all time, um, Andy Roberts, Sir Curtly Ambrose, and of course, we have had uh, 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 several other players. But because of that, the international recognition that those players brought to Antigua and Barbuda, it was always very difficult for, for if, a, if a young boy or girl growing up in Antigua and Barbuda, at the time of 65,000 people, 108 square miles, and you're turning on the television and watching somebody that you saw just down the street from you, playing at Lords, playing at Perth in Australia, the whole island would be up at three and four o'clock in the morning just listening to the radio to hear the exploits of our heroes. And so ultimately, cricket won the hearts and minds of everybody aspiring to be an athlete and everybody who wanted to be just like those guys to bring that type of recognition to Antigua. So football had a very difficult path in competing with that over the, the years. Good thing was after an aggressive campaign beginning in 2012, where the association then began to believe that we had a chance to push forward in World Cup qualification, the, a massive campaign was undertaken. They rebranded the organization and named the, 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 the men's senior team the Benner Boys. And for those of you who may not understand Antiguan vernacular, the Benner is any music that is not Christian in Antigua. And specifically, it relates mostly to Calypso and Sopa. So the Benner Boys became, it was a massive competition that they had, they ran nationally. And as it turned out, my future stepmother was the person who won that competition at the time. Funny how life goes. But uh, so the, the team rebranding of Benner Boys and Benner Girls was a very successful rebranding. And it helped to kind of bring football to a place and in terms of, of where we stood in the country. And I think from there, it only grew from strength to strength. And I can say from there, and cricket took a, a nosedive in terms of its popularity. Also, that was tied to the demise of the West Indies in terms of its place in, in, in popularity in the Caribbean. Going a little bit forward, in 2017, after some well-documented struggles, the ABFA engaged in an honest and brutal introspection and held meetings with all stakeholders. From these consultations, a new strategic plan was enacted, enacted. And according to the president, at the time, uh, you can see he has quite a bit to say there. But one of the most important things that he said in that piece, and I quote, while the road ahead is clear, 
we can expect some bumps along the way. Our diverse community will not always agree on every priority. Ultimately, we will all have the same goal, to be able to stand proud with our fellow Antiguans and Barbudans as we build towards becoming the leading football country in the region. Now, it was a bold plan. It spoke to uh, how we were going to develop the game and it, the strategic coming out of that, the analysis, re out of that came some key focus areas. And as you can see here, governance and management, marketing and revenue generation, communication and IT, infrastructure and technical development were the key pillars that this plan was going to be built on. However, there were some issues. And before I get to how that all tied in together, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Margaret Messiah, ABFA Financial Controller. And in keeping, in keeping with the key strategic plan objective, your financial controller was chosen from a pool of applicants and a full-scale overhaul of financial management and a new era of enhanced accountability was to begin. But once again, what we found is that every step we were making in the right direction, there was one key pillar that kept turning us back on our head. And so before I get to that, I'm going to introduce um, Ms. Messiah to just give you an overview as to um, uh, Can you just give me a second? I have to get something for Ms. Messiah quickly. We thought we were going to use this laptop at first, but we had to switch, so. so uh, okay, good morning. Um, the ABFA is currently occupying a very, very small office space within the ARG. I don't know how many of you have been there. <laughs> Probably just a handful. Okay, and within that so small um, space is a small room that's designated for the president, <laughs> the general secretary, and myself. Um, as you can well imagine, that small, limited space negatively impacts implementing many of the accounting functions and processes that we find it necessary for the proper functioning of an accounting department. Anyway, um, upon taking up the role of the financial controller, um, short of a one year, October last year, I realized that there were many issues that required immediate attention. Um, we needed a finance accounting manual, an updated and comprehensive chart of accounts, a functioning budget process um, where we, we I could do analysis to actuals on a monthly basis, things like that. Um, monitoring of financial statements analysis and the internal control process was really needed to be looked at. Um, after meeting and consultations with after meetings and consultations with the general secretary, um, he said that basically in a few months, because I would have only been there like a week or so, he advised that in a few months um, we're going to be moving to a technical center, a new technical center. So um, that one big hurdle should be behind us. Um, in the meantime, however. He said he had already begun consultation with speaking to other MAs in regards to getting a, um, advice and stuff on the finance slash accounting manual um, to compare with the draft that he had been preparing. Okay, um, fast forward to the current um, period. Um, despite the challenges, as I said, um, internal controls have been significantly improved. Um, the accounting records are now, um, and they continue to be correctly managed. Uh, updated QuickBooks was 
installed once I got there. We're now using the 2019 version. Um, there it has been a complete overhaul of, again, be, even though we have a limited space, I've completely overhauled the whole filing and record keeping in the office. Um, budget to actual statements are now being produced. And for the 11th straight year, um, we have been able to present audited financial statements to the members and the public despite all our challenges. Okay, so I'm gonna turn you back over to Ruan. Okay, so time is limited, but uh, let, me, let me just circle back to what I was ex describing before. As with governance and management, and as, as Ms. Messiah correctly stated, uh, we found ourselves in a situation of limited space, limited ability to build out the organization, to hire the key um, staff in the roles that we required. So governance and management issues kept, kept rearing their heads and not being able to solve them because we were, we were confined by space and the resources available in terms of physical resources. Then the same with the marketing and, and revenue generation because of limited space. Again, you can't hire the staff. You don't have the space to put them. Um, the technical issues were raising their heads because even a, a meeting room to discuss technical issues, to host coaches, everything was costing us extra money. If we wanted to have a, a course, we'd have to hire a conference room, go to a hotel somewhere, it was costing us more. The communication and IT issues are the same. An area to host press conferences, an area to host, uh, to, to host um, meaningful discussion with stakeholders, we just were not able to provide that kind of environment. So we kept circling back all the time to one key problem, infrastructure development. So even though on the field issues were going to be solved by the infrastructure development, we were also finding ourselves constrained for growth by the fact that we, we needed a new facility. Um, one of the things that I wanted to show was a uh, problem we had with infrastructure. We only have access to one lighted pitch on the in the country and we only have access to it six months a year but during that time this is what happens this is the state of the field when we play our premier league i know some of you have been there and this is the state of the pitch when we get it back and so this costs us between 35 and 50 thousand us dollars a year just to rehabilitate it to play our premier league and our most important leagues that also our biggest, some of our biggest um, revenue and generation. Grass. And this is real grass, and this is what we have to go through every year. And as a matter of fact, these are the photographs from 2018. If you saw it, and uh, some members, uh, Mr. Glean was there, I know Mr. Um, um, Veron was there, went with, with Gianni Infantino and Mr. Montagliani. <laughs> it was actually worse this year. So our leagues that were supposed to begin in September cannot begin until the end of October. And those delays of obviously have their whatever. And currently we don't receive any financial assistance from the government. However, because of the high level visit recently, that has now triggered conversations and I now have a meeting with the Prime Minister next week. Right, so this led us to having to move to the Technical Center project. When I, I said 2018, I used 2018 pictures because this plan was being developed last year. So. This was the original master plan that was developed some years before. However, it was an ambitious plan, and given the fact that the cost to develop it would be much greater than the funds we had available to us. So it was necessary for us to revise the plan, and this, was now, this is now the revised plan, a, a blueprint of it, with two pitches instead of the five pitches that two plan. But this is the key thing. Right here is where the, the new headquarter building will be constructed, which is actually under construction thanks to FIFA and FIFA Forward Program. Um, and if you notice, it takes a much less, it takes up the, the, the smaller footprint on the entire project, even though it's still uh, 3,000 square feet under construction. And the whole plot is 12 acres of land. And estimated the, the, the head office should be finished in the next five weeks. So we're hoping to be able to move in shortly in November. And this is the entire project, it's budget, it's the whole, table is there from lighting to seating to the second artificial pitch, second lighting, training pool, food venue, pavilion, the whole thing is broke down. That's the summary in terms of the current state of the affairs. These are some of the, 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 uh, 
the, the phases that are, that are earmarked for the, the pitch, the lighting, which is already started, the purchase was done, the lighting construction is on next week, starts next week, sorry. This is the installation of it, this, this, the seating, and this is the beautiful new headquarters that's gonna be there in a matter of weeks. So, uh, public restrooms, and this is the final phase, which will be a, a 42 room dormitory on the, the site. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Oops, sorry. Not a um, question, but a statement. I love the background information on assessing the need for the structure. Um, it'd be nice to know a little more about the structure, but I know it's rushing down, so we will um, read it in your, in your um, write-up. Structure? Yeah. No, what you're building. Like, oh, to get a little more yeah. essence of the oh, thing. Okay, yes. Because yes. I love that picture. I think it looks really well, and you know that, I don't know if the front section, which is glass, it means that you have... Oh, no, 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 like that's, you, that's a that, rendering. That's not exactly what... Oh, you had me impressed. <laughs> that. Oh, geez. Not remember, that? We, I'm disappointed. That's, originally, we were going with that, but remember, we live in the hurricane belt. Yes, yes. And so it was thought that that would, you know, carry costs up a little too much. So yeah. yeah. But I, I thought when I saw it, I said, you know, well, the way that was built was to see the pits, see what's mm -hmm. going on, so... but. Regardless, very nice. But as you mentioned, the hurricane, was a risk assessment done mm. to the yes. overall? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there was a hurricane risk assessment that was done. And that also was a key factor in how we were trying to develop the project in terms of its construction, because costs of construction rise exponentially during the hurricane season for obvious reasons. And the risk of not being, because you can't get insurance. Because nobody's going to insure you and you're building during a period that is uh, hurricane season. You're really not going to get it or you're gonna have to pay a ridiculous amount to get it. So that was, that was one of the risk factors that we considered. And we tried to employ a method, but it fell out of alignment with how FIFA wanted the, the construction process to take place, because we were trying to build it in a vertical construction method, which would have allowed for us to build with one set of mobilization. And so if we are doing a field that requires excavation, then you can do lighting excavation at the same time and that would have allowed us to maximize on cost overruns or cost, um, because we wanted to have as much, we didn't want to use all of our project funds on just infrastructure, because that was not the only pillar in, in the key focus area. So we wanted to be able to have funds left over for youth development, technical development, communication IT, all the other things. So we wanted to make sure we weren't committing all of our project funds to just construction. That way we would have been able to leave back enough there for other things if we were able to employ this method. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we have a change in schedule. We'll have cooks and takers. They decided they will go um, in for US Virgin Island. Then we'll have a 30 minutes, 30 minutes lunch break instead of 45 minutes just to keep the time tight. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Liverpool won, Leicester won. I'm, I'm in a little morning and stuff like that. Um, my name is Oliver Smith. I'm General Secretary of the Turks and Caicos Island Football Association, and I'm going to take you through a project which is the revitalization of the women's football. Um, I must start off by thanking my right and left hand, Sakia Hall for um, assisting in the drafting of um, this presentation. Um, 
She assisted greatly in it, and, uh, and she put a lot of time in it. I put some. I put what I thought was critical, and I'm happy for her. I'm happy that she was able to put it in a format that um, we all can digest it because I'm new to this PowerPoint thing, so forgive me. Um, Turks and Caicos Island is a country of approximately 30-something 30, 30 thousand people, depends on the time of year. In August, it goes down to about, goes down to about 15,000. And we have a, a, a f one of the few female presidents, and um, her role and goal is to try to revitalize our women's football program. Um, we do have much growth or, or development of women's football over the past few years. Um, this is a combination of our low population, lack of certified coaches, and the little talented females that we have, they tend to go off to play football in the overseas in um, colleges, and they never return. So our project goals is to continuously improve, develop, and promote, and regulate the game of football with special attention geared towards women's football. And we have a two-year goal to revitalize the women's football program with a commencement date of January 2020. So where are we going with this? It's our intention to attract, inspire, and encourage female participation of all ages with an ultimate goal of raising the numbers, ultimately reintroducing a women's football league, and obviously matriculate a, a pool of talented players for the national program, and additionally to create player pathways from grassroots to scholarship opportunities with the hope that those players who leave will eventually come back to play in our national teams. And um, here's a little picture of um, our youth program because we have started with our youth program. We have emphasized our girls under 14, and we are hoping that these um, young ladies will be the future of our, um, our national team. That's a picture taken when they were um, in a, a tournament in Cuba in July of this year. Our objectives, how we intend to get there? Well, our first plan was to retain a director of women's football. Um, we started that um, early, late last year when we were, were able to obtain the services of Unelsis Rodriguez Baez, a, a female player in the Cuban national program. And um, she coached in the Cuban national program and she has now come across as our um, director of women's football. We intend to increase the technical cap cap capabilities and competence of our coaches and um, recruit <coughs> recruitment strategies and initiative for potential coaches and players. Um, the second objective is to select and train four female development officers. Turks and Caicos is um, sort of unique in that we have um, sister islands that can only be accessed either by boats or plane. You can't walk to any of those sister islands. And those are Providenciales, which is the main island, Grand Turk, which is the capital, South Caicos, and then a twin island of Middle and North Caicos. So it's, it's our objective in growing the women's program to get four and specifically female coaches. We, we believe that um, we start with getting um, light coaches, light gender coaches on each of those islands to um, source the players and to um, introduce football, not introduce, reintroduce football on those islands. The third objective is to hire a head coach for the national women's team. And when I said head coach, we mean head coaches. We like to try to transition one from the under 14. We start with under 14. We now have one and the under 14. And as we grow the numbers and grow the age group, we, um, as the under 14 matriculates to the 15s and the 17s, we hire coaches for the, the group that they left. And we want to create um, an international competitive teams. Fourth objective in, in assisting the growth of football, we, we um, want to improve our capacity building, and that's my mistake, my spelling mistake, not Zakia. Zakia is perfect. It, 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 uh, and we want to provide administrative, technical, and coaching education opportunities for those on and off the field, and supplement our female-specific coaching education courses. We just did one at CONCACAF. We had um, three coaches who went to um, Antigua. And we want to create opportunities for more because we think without the knowledge and without getting coaches who are specifically trained to coach females, um, we'll have some issues. And we decided to throw in some pictures. Um, these are some of our co past coaching education courses. As um, We have a problem with retention. Um, I think it's typical around most of these islands. People turn up for the, for the uniform and the bags and the shoes. And 
and, and the meals, and then you don't see them. So we, we, we aim in, in revitalizing, our, revitalizing our program to try to um, retain as much of these coaches as possible. Well, the key staff members are there, um, the general secretary, media marketing, general secretary obviously to guide and, and caress and put you guys in the right direction. I'm the general secretary. And the media and marketing person, technical director, director of women's football, assistant director of women's football, head coaches. I want to get a full complement of coaches for the national team. And, and, and let me pause there to say that what's been happening in small territories, at least I could speak for Turks and Caicos Island, is that we usually have, um, you know, we have shortages of coaches, so you probably usually get just a, a head coach and an assistant coach, and, and, and that's it. No, in revitalizing the women's program and playing, it, playing specific and serious interest towards it, we like to get a full complement of coaches, going from a fitness coach, a goalkeeper coach, a nutritionist, a medical doctor, as well as a physiotherapist. Um, not only for when we have an international games, but also for um, or practice sessions because I think once we adopt a professional approach in treating these players, it may increase um, participation and it may, it may increase our, um, our retention levels. There's an organizational chart. Um, I don't know how to magnify it, but you can see it, it starts over the president and um, it flows down to the technical department. The project team charter. Um, the project name, as you see, is the revitalization of the women's football in TCI. And the sponsors, we have FIFA Forward. By sponsors, we need the financial partners. FIFA Forward program. It, um, I'm not sure how many of you have difficulties with getting our money from FIFA. We, we do have difficulties in getting our money from FIFA. I'm, I'm saying that specifically to Mr. Glean. Um, because uh, one of the issues that we have is that FIFA, in their guidelines, will, will indicate that at a youth level, they encourage under 12, they, up to under 12, they encourage co-ed um, participation in games. Um, they say co-ed games is the best practices. And, and when we, as an organization, follow our master and our lead of FIFA and organize co-ed games, we're now told that, um, no, you can't get the money because you're supposed to organize um, um, under 13 females and under 13 boys, and under 11 boys and under, under 11 girls, when they're saying at the same time, um, COVID is the best practice. So they're sucking and blowing at the same time, and at the same time, <laughs> sucking the money from our coffers. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Glean will take that back to, to FIFA. Uh, <laughs> and Miss, Miss, Miss Daniel Lewis as well. Now, administration, ground rules are set out there for your reading um, benefits. I, I won't bore you with it. I'll just move on to the, some of the essential um, points. Um, this is our budget. It's, um, I'll come to that later on in a, in, a, in a fashion where you can actually read it. The estimated budget, we figure it's going to be $1.4 million. Um, for the initiation and planning phase, we figure that 35% of the budget will be used towards that in terms of recruiting and capacity building. The training and development, we figure 45 percent, and for that we think of um, local leagues. Um, given our um, our size and our small um, player pool, we um, intend to have in our local leagues essentially small-sided games, both indoors and outdoors futsal and small-sided games, because we don't have the numbers that um, would facilitate 11 v 11. Also. Within a small-sided games, we think it's you know even, we think it's also critical in development of, of our sport because we believe that with small-sided games, um, people get more touches on the ball, um, the players get more engaged, and it's a, a good opportunity to retain our players and keep them interested in coming back. Under the media and marketing element, we we look looking at getting 20 percent, and um, we measure our success by um, we have su technical success and growth measurement. Now, what's the schedule? We hope to start, um, we hope by the end of 20, 2020, we have a, a, a women's league form. And uh, let me pause here to say that our women's league is actually, will be um, dominated by, by, by under 15 and under 16 players, because that is the pool that we have. Most of the older players that we have in our, in our islands are retired, they are now, um, Settled down, married, have babies, working at in the entertainment in the hospitality industry, and not willing to come back to the program. 
So we believe that we should best start by um, dealing with our youth players. So the Women's League is actually a youth league. We want to educate and retain certified coaching staff. We want to produce players and it could be competitive nationally. And by the end of 2022, we hope that our status internationally and regionally will be um, developed in terms of um, elevated in terms of ranking. That's our schedule of events. You could read it at your leisure because I was told I only have five minutes left. Um, the competition structure, we, um, we're going to have a Premier League. We plan to have six or ten teams participating. Um, we hope to have that league spread out for six to eight months so we can satisfy not only our FIFA requirements, but we can satisfy our goal to create more playing opportunities um, for our players. And we hope to have matches twice per week um, with a minimum of um, 90 games um, with the clubs registered on the FIFA Connect. Now the girls' competition, as I said before, the girls will be playing both in the women's league and in this league. We have a local league that's known as the Fortis League that's sponsored by our, um, our power company. Currently, we have 10 teams participating. We want to keep that going. As also from for six months, and um, do you see the schedule and hopefully have a, a, a minimum of 112 games. Um, to your right, you see um, our new technical director, Andrew Edwards, who is who's critical um, in the development of this program. Um, internationally, I, I didn't hear that question. Go Liverpool. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. So I love Mr. Marlon Glean. He brings pleasure to me in many different ways. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure none of us minds are in the gutter. So you can move on. National Women's Team Competition, we have a minimum of four FIFA approved matches per year. And then for the girls, four FIFA approved matches per year. Um, this is us, our national under 14 team in um, Puerto Rico. Um, for the last for the last series of games, and the budgeting we went through that very quickly. Um, the, the process created by the director of women's football reviewed, amended, and approved by the general secretary, and it is presented to the executive committee for final approval. And our funding comes from FIFA, and sure gates, and sure sponsorships. Um, the cost estimate for friendlies is, is broken down there. It's um, and you could take a look at it. What are the risks? Um, we have limited, um, I just deal with our weaknesses right there, the limited certified coaches, very little revenue generation, limited or no sponsorship, and the fact that our small population size leads to small-sided games. And we have, at present, very limited fan participation. Our SWOT analysis is spelled out there for you guys. I, um, I, could, I encourage you to read it. Um, <clears throat> Just move back to the national competitions and international competitions are there. Um, the National Women's National Competitions Committee will be formed to manage all national competitions and they will regulate, monitor and evaluate the formation and execution of Women's Premier League and they have an LOC for the international competitions. And that picture there is our current national team. Um, the oldest person is to the left in the back and, um, and everybody else is either under 20 and if you see a um, couple under 14 girls in the back. Questions? Questions? Because I, I only have a minute left. Marketing and, and media strategies all spelled out. It, I, I make sure I put it in um, all caps so everybody have e I have no problem reading it when, when it's your time to go through it. Our measurable outcomes, increasing the number of participants, increasing our technical capacity, increasing our technical competency, increasing the number of competitions and tournaments, increasing our international ranking, and more stakeholder participation and sponsorship. Thank you. No questions? Are we, feel, are we a little chilly? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just have a question. 
which is a little bit out of curiosity. You um, mentioned it, um, revitalization of women's football and then reintroduction of um, a women's football league. Yes. That means that there was something before? Yes, there was, um, we had a, a women's program before. Um, in about 2000, and uh, we had a, a pretty vibrant women's league. And in about 2010, we decided to, to part ways with our, with our technical director because we had some concerns, not only, uh, nothing about his technical capacity and his uh, organization. We had some concerns about his relationship with the, um, with the, with the females. Nothing proven, but you know, better to be safe and sorry. I, I noticed Ruan, Ruan laughing. And as a result of that, um, for other reasons, we decided to not renew his contract. That resulted, in addition to people migrating and went into school, going to school, in a, 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 a hit back against us in that we lost a lot of girls. We lost, lost a lot of females. And there was an attempt made to, to revitalize the program, and, and it was not thought out, not concerted, not, not strategic enough. And then we realized that we have to refocus and that's where we are, where we're doing right now. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, uh, I just want to highlight a uh, positive from it. Um, the, the success criteria at the end. Yes. I think um, you, you, everyone should actually try and highlight your success criteria at the end as the, you know, you have identified a strategic goal, how are you gonna measure it at the end? Okay, so highlight something like that. And, and just the cost of hiring all these um, new new coaches. Yes. Do you have an, it's not, I it's, don't know, we wasn't able to see it. That, but it's in that fine print breakdown, you'll oh, okay. see, you know. All right. I couldn't read it myself, <laughs> but it's there. All right then. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have. Um, Thanks. So the lunch is on its way. It's, um, there's a little bit of traffic, weather, and so I think Suriname said they will, they will present, so we'll continue and don't lose time. If you want, we could take two minutes. If you want a hot cup of coffee or a little tea, two minutes, eh? one, two. <laughs>
half minutes. <laughs> so we, um, Suriname is all set up. Good afternoon, everybody. If I sound a bit nervous, it's because I actually am nervous standing in front of everybody. I'm not used to talking, uh, standing in front of everyone. Uh, my name is Ratna Siuraj. I'm the finance manager of the Suriname so Football Bond. Uh, you all know us as Suriname Football Association. The Suriname Football Association is the governing body of football in Suriname. The headquarter is located at the Leticia Fritza Land, um, number seven. A lot of people have, a lot of you have um, already been there. Um, the SVB was founded on the 1st of October 1920 and is affiliated to the FIFA since 1929. Um, I would like to share with you our mission and vision. Unfortunately, I don't have it on the screen. I'm just going to read it out to you. Our vision is, with football being our leading sport, the SVB will inspire our nation with better football for all, on and off the pitch. Our mission is, SVB is committed to professionally manage, develop, promote, and f promote football at all level. I think that we would all agree that Having a good infrastructure and mainly having good facilities is one of the main pillars for the development of football. Therefore, one of, our, uh, one of our strategic goals is to improve the infrastructures, not only of our own, um, of the SVB, but also of our member associations. In order to emphasize the importance of this project, which is the construction of a multifunctional sports complex at Albina Hills. Um, I would like to give an overview of the football that is being played in Suriname. So in Suriname, we have the first division, we have the second division, we have women's football and we have youth football. Then we have the regional associations. We have 18 regional associations in total. All 18 of them are locate, located in 10 different districts of Suriname. This is an example of how the 10 districts of Suriname is divided. The colored ones, uh, ones at the top, those are the areas which is mainly populated. As you can see, the largest part of Suriname is mostly forest, jungle, and we have a lot of indigenous people living there. Um, the project at hand was initiated by one of our regional, regional associations, which is the Albina Sport Bond, 
and Albina Sportborn is right over here. Um, they are part of the district Marowena, and Albina um, Sportborn is Albina is the city of Marowena, and they are located alongside the Marowena River, right across French Guyana. I would like to tell you some more about um, um, Albina. Um, we have over 1,100 registered um, athletes. Um, there are various schools competitions which is uh, organized uh, annually. A lot of villages um, which are alongside the Marwene Rifir. They are, they, they are still deprived of um, football. Please, take off your arm. Okay. So why is this project important for Suriname? Like I said, um, it is one of our strategic goals to help the infrastructure of our member association. And Compared to the other 17 member associations, Albina Sport Bond has the worst playing surface of all. And they, they have had the worst, um, the least opportunities for any kind of development due to the internal war, which was in 1986, where you had a lot of pond, uh, plundering, people were killed, villages were burned down. So they have the le had had the opportunity for at least um, development in that area. And um, according to uh, statistics, um, there are a lot of um, talented youth players in that area, but they don't have the opportunity to play football and develop their skills. And also because of the distance, even though um, Albina has uh, at least one uh, team in our first division, they have to travel at least 200 kilometers up and down just to play a home match. So, um, in executing this project would not only develop the local football and the local community of Albina, but it would also benefit football in general and also on national level for us. Like I men mentioned, the project at hand was initiated by Albina Sportbon, and it mainly consists of two phases. Phase one is the construction of a fence, um, making sure that the drainage and spr sprinkler uh, installation is in place, a uh, soccer field that meets at least minimum standards, a covered stand, and dressing rooms and storage area. Phase one would um, take maybe one year, and um, when that is finished, we would go to the second phase. Uh, that is uh, a construction of multifunctional sport field, multifunctional building, an office, office for the facility manager, multi-purpose indoor sport hall, swimming pool, tennis court, and a basketball court. So how the objectives of this um, project is expansion development of football, especially for youth, um, central organizing of sports in Albina, so um, all of the people, all of the fans, they don't have to drive 200 kilometers to the, into the city. Creation of a center for inter international sports matches in which the neighboring countries of Suriname and eventually beyond may be able to participate. And also important is revival of the community again. So how would we go about uh, the project? Um, under the FIFA Forward 2.0, um, we are aware that we have to fulfill certain criteria before we go on to other projects. And uh, the criteria are you should have at least one stadium pitch which, which fulfills FIFA standards for playing international matches. Suriname is currently uh, in the process of um, 
uh, tendering for that project. Uh, we believe that uh, by the second, by the first quarter of 2020, this project will be finished. So we believe that the um, project for Albina Sportband will be uh, submitted after that. We have already fulfilled the other two criteria. We have a, a suitable headquarter and we have a, a functioning technical center. Um, the project is in alignment with our contract of agreed objectives. Like I mentioned, one of the objectives is that we help our member association in um, improving, improving their infrastructure. Um, the project will be approved by the SVB board and it will be communicated to the SVB members. As far as the land ownership goes, um, currently the uh, government has given Albina Sport Bond um, a plot, which is on their name. But the Albina Sport Bond has agreed to sign over the rights to the SVB so that we can invest FIFA forward funds into the um, accommodation and the facility. The project application. The infra, as it is an infrastructure project, the special um, designed um, application form will be used. It will be signed off by the president and the GS. Two originals will be sent by uh, to FIFA and a copy will be emailed to Barbados office. The, we will make sure that we have all the supporting documentation such as business case, which would include project description, beneficiaries, maintenance plan, cost breakdown, land documentation, approval of SVB board, communication to the SVB members, uh, building permit, insurance, site photos, project design. Uh, the project cost is less than uh, 300,000 for phase one. Um, this will be refused, uh, reviewed process approved by the FIFA GS within 30 days. And after 10 days, we expect a SOA to be issued. And within 30 days, we would sign this uh, SOA off and send it to send two originals to the FIFA and a copy to Barbados office. Um, the procurement process, as per the regulations of FIFA, um, since the project is um, it's uh, it consists of two parts. One part for the uh, architect, which is um, around 10,000. So one code would be sufficient. And since it is a project that is below 300,000, um, it w three codes would be um, uh, required. But uh, in order to um, risk, to avoid the risk of not uh, receiving enough quotations, we would not uh, uh, ask three uh, companies, but we would ask more just to be sure, make sure that we get enough quotations. Um, the tender documents uh, will be sent off to all companies. And for detailed information and to get more hands-on information about the site, a mandatory site visit will be held. Bids will be received on one specific date and time. The envelopes will be opened in front of everybody for transparency reasons and uh, it will be evaluated by a, a com special committee and based on a price quality criteria experience with identical project, the project will be awarded and the contracts will be drawn up in line with the SOA. The project implementation, um, construction will be carried out according to timetable and further detailed work breakdown schedule. Um, I believe that it is very important that um, the project implementation is uh, should be uh, executed according to a well thought out plan, which is linked to targets and goals. Because compared to other projects, such as, for example, purchasing a bus, a construction project is much more complicated and has more, much more risk that we should consider. So working according to a detailed plan will have many benefits. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I just want to share something else. Um, recently, I had the opportunity to uh, visit the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. And uh, I asked the tour guide, how long did it take to construct this? And he said, it took 10 years of planning and five years of construction. And I was very surprised. 
I didn't expect that. So it only shows how important it is that you plan everything very well. Um, reporting after the, uh, during the implementation of the project, interim reports will be submitted via the Barbados office as it will be in line with the SOA for milestone payments. Um, the completion. Completion, uh, after the completion, a completion uh, report will be um, drawn up. The constructor will hand over a maintenance and service manual. A final report will be um, submitted and final invoice will be um, sent to the FIFA and the project will be completed. Thank you. How does that facility fit in with the uh, complete plan? Um, is this only one multi-purpose court that you will have in Suriname or you have others? What was the last part? If you have one multi-purpose, well, you're proposing to build one, so mm -hmm. would that be the only multi-purpose sports facility or do you have others? So actually, we're not going to build this, finance the whole thing. We're, we will do only part of it. But um, like I said, one of the reasons why we chose Albina Sport is because the lack of development that they have experienced over the past um, uh, decades and uh, also because the capacity, the potential players that, they, they are, that are there, but they don't have the means to uh, develop their skills. And actually, Albina Sport 1 is one of the only um, association who came to the SUB with a project and was willing to ride over all the rides to their grounds to us in order to get help. And compared to the other 17 uh, regional associations, they have um, reason reasonably good um, facilities. Okay, that's similar to the question I was going to ask, that it's a multifunctional facility, which I saw would have swimming, tennis, which all are not football, but you just said that you will not be funding no. the entire thing. No. So, because you also said that there was no government support, not no government funding, so. They have a gentleman's agreement, but in Suriname we know what that means, and especially that is a political risk for us because uh, in 2020 we have um, elections, and every time the government changes, people forget what they promise, and they just, you, you don't hear anything uh, uh, from them. So. Uh, funding is very important right now to secure that. They have also spoken to um, the Dutch Football Association, KNVB, who is also willing to um, uh, pay part of the funding. Okay, so one of the risks is that it may not, the whole thing may not be. Decided. That's why it's divided in two phases. Oh, okay. yeah. um, do you have a WBS? I saw you mentioned it. Excuse me? You will break down schedule. I saw you mentioned it, but do you was one done for the project? Or it, will it be done? It will be done, yeah. I just had the summarized one and I tried to work out one. Any additional question? will they? Mm -hmm. Well, they have uh, um, support from KNPB and the government doesn't support any kind of sports. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, I don't know, is that, uh, is that, um, What's the right word? Is that something that we must have in order to get approval from FIFA? Because up to now, the government hasn't helped us in any way. I think, um, uh, I'm trying to, the, um, the area, that's a sports club and they have their own funding and it's mm -hmm. their facility. 
So you're just doing the football part, is that yes. it? Yes, part of right. football, yes. Yeah, so I, I think that, right, mm -hmm. so it's clear. <laughs> okay. All right. So thank you very much. So we will break for lunch. We're on time. We're doing well. So um, we could start back at 1 or oh, just about, about 1.10. One, one let, we'll try to stick to 1. One. All righty. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>